everyone. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the co-organizers for this project. And for those who are watching, welcome to Flute Futures. This is a workshop co-presented by the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra, the Canadian Music Centre, and the Association for Canadian Women Composers um, as part of an ongoing festival all month, um, digital, working with different kinds of flute music, different kinds of composed music. Um, I really encourage you to check it out and we'll drop links about the larger, broader scope of the festival that's going on this month in the chat. Um, but yeah, I wanted to welcome everybody who's watching, who's tuning in, who's participating to this workshop. We're streaming now from the Canadian Music Centre in Takarano. That's Treaty 13 territory. That's the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas of the New Credit, Chippewa, and Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples. Um, and I do want to note two of the co-organizers here, Canadian Music Centre, the Association for Canadian Mu Women Composers, um, name the Canadian nation state in their names. So when we're looking at this kind of institutionalized music, this kind of composed music, I think it's something to acknowledge and not only acknowledge, but actively work to do something about. So food for thought as we start this workshop today. Um, one of the things that the co-organizers were really working on when we were conceiving of this workshop was thinking about what composers and what creators of composed music are in need of right now. And one of those things that we thought was important was resources, time, space, and opportunities to collaborate. So that's basically the premise of this project. We have four hours. We have two wonderful flute players who are going to serve as mentor artists, Sophie Lanthier and Anne Fang. Um, and every hour, they're going to be working with a different artist on a project that that artist um, has asked for some input on from the professional flute player. Um, so they're going to work together. They're going to chat. We're going to hear some clips of some things and see some things on screen um, and kind of peek in on what their collaborative process is like as these artists kind of fine tune these projects for flute that they're in the middle of right now. Um, so if you have questions, thoughts, ideas, feel free to drop them in the chat. Someone will be monitoring. And otherwise, um, I'm super excited to welcome you and to kind of hear everyone's music today. Um, so first up, um, I'm, I'd love to welcome Sophie Lantier, who is going to be taking the lead for the first two hours of this workshop. Um, and then I'll let her introduce um, the artist who she's going to be working with. Thank you. Hello there, hopefully everyone can see me okay. Um, so the first piece that I'm working on is with Corinne Morsing. Uh, I'm not sure if you can pin the video or, but uh, it's nice to meet you. My name is Sophie Lancier and uh, I play the flute and today you will see me play exclusively bass flute, which is really, really fun. Um, there's not enough repertoire out there for bass flute. So I'm really glad that there's some really good stuff that we'll be able to work on today. Um, now, Corinne, would you like me to play through the piece as I see it, or uh, do you have any immediate questions for me? I'm happy to hear it if uh, if it seems to you playable. <laughs> yeah, I was sure. I was concerned if there was anything it was just in completely impossible <laughs> that we'd have to discuss first. Well, no, I but mean, if it's uh, yeah, I, I can play it as I've sort of worked on it. Um, I, I have adjusted a few things here and there, but we can discuss that afterwards and uh, talk okay. about some of the base flute techniques. So I'll just play a few okay, notes that's to make, super. Sure, make sure my face works. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Sorry, my no, okay. in the middle of the internet connection sort of died on me, so I didn't hear one little phrase, but That's it was okay. great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was, oh, is there any possibility if you could um, play the measure 23 again, uh, 23, 24? And, yes. Because that's where the connection suddenly went oh, funny. Totally fine, that's fine. I figure we'll probably go over this part <laughs> again anyway. <laughs> sure, okay. I'll do uh, 23 and 24 for you. Okay, super. Okay, so, yeah, um, I just wanted to give some disclaimers. As far as interpreting the Aeolian sound, um, I wasn't sure if you wanted a sustained air sound with the fingers over top or individually kind of like semi-articulated um, punches of air in rhythm. Ah, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I was thinking of it sort of just a continual blowing of air. Okay. Uh, of course, yeah, you have to take a breath somewhere in there, probably. I mean, uh, but uh, rather than okay. <laughs> sure. single breath, <laughs> yeah, that's that totally makes fine, sense. Yeah. Uh, would you like me to try 24 with a continuous breath? Sure, yeah, okay. great. <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it's a coordination it of like making sure the key clicks still sound nice and loud, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was, there was, um, I had, I had heard different ways that uh, the key clicks. Sometimes the key click, you can get an up sound as well as a down sound, and yeah. I wasn't sure how fast, how possible that is. Yeah. So when it comes to key clicks, um, it depends on if you want more of like the percussive mechanism sound or a pitch. Uh -huh. So if you're, if you want yeah. a mechanism sound, then. It's not, it doesn't, like, especially with the key drumming parts, like the bass flute is kind of perfect for it because it's kind of a noisy <laughs> instrument anyway. Um, as far as pitch sounding, that's when you really only get it if you're putting fingers down. So it works best in low descending passages. So oh, okay. for example, um, in measure five, uh, with the C sharp and the C natural, not a whole lot is changing there. So it's kind of hard, like the higher C sharp and C natural, it's kind of hard to get any sound out of a key click there. So I'm kind of throwing down some extra fingers to get some sort of percussive sound um, but then when i go to the a g f d it sounds very pitchy and good um, okay. coming back up when you're lifting fingers up those end up having to be upward key clicks um, and they're a little bit quiet uh, but they do still make a sound it's just It, I think key clicks are more difficult to hear when it's an ascending passage, just given the, the scale of the instrument itself. Great. Yep. Um, uh, you had some questions in the score itself um, regarding pitch bends. Um, what's interesting about the mm -hmm. bass flute is that it, I think the bigger right. the flute, the less flexible it is with pitch. So on piccolo, you know, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. You can do so many things, but it's also so hard to play in tune because the pitch goes everywhere. Um, and then with the bass flute, I can bend it down to about a semitone at the most. Um, some people say you can only do a quarter tone, oh, but okay. I, I challenge that. <laughs> I think you can, you can get a, about a semitone. Um, and because we don't have holes in the keys, we can't do any sort of pitch band bends with our fingers like you would on the C flute, but it's more of a so the sound kind of follows it a little bit dynamically um, because it has to roll in a lot. Um, so you can never do quick pitch bends, but these ones work completely fine. I just can't go down a major second. Uh, it's about a semitone at the most. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was wondering about. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it sounded like yeah, it sounded like you weren't having trouble with that. So was, okay. <laughs> I'm always worried if I'm going to write something no. and then it's going to be like the. the you're gonna say, "Oh no, it's <laughs> no, 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 it's okay." Take it out. It's I basically, I just, I looked at all the pitch bends and I said, "Okay, I can do a semitone at the most. Um, I can't do bigger than that, right. um, but okay. it gets the effect. The effect comes across." So, right. Yeah. Um, okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. As far as measure seven with the harmonics. Um, 
in this case, the harmonic, the G and the A, now I, I missed them a little bit sound-wise this time around. The G and the A, uh, you've written the lower G and the lower A as the sort of the bass fingering. Um, but on the flute, they're actually the same fingering, so you won't end up getting the harmonic sound. But if you write as the bass fingering a low C and a low D, and then the flute player knows to overblow that to the G and the A. Um, so... What I did was I actually wrote in a low C below the G, so I can still get that cool harmonic coloring. Um, but also get the, the pitch that you're looking for. So that just allows the, the harmonic to sound as opposed to just the straight fingering. Can I keep the video free? Oh, oh no. <laughs> I think we had some technical difficulties. So it's like an extra. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you're able to hear much of that. Um, but yeah, I measure. That's my connection. Is... <laughs> Sorry about that. No, my connection okay. is going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. But I'll uh, be able to hear it. Up. I'll, I'll listen to it up again afterwards. But sure. That's a, yeah, I don't mind repeating the... it, though. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, measure seven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh -huh. uh, measure seven with the harmonics. Um, you've written them starting on the, the low G and the low A but it's actually the same fingering for the upper octave too. So you don't end up getting the harmonic sound that you would get if you're playing a different fingering. So I kind of changed it. So instead of, which are technically still not harmonics. So I wrote a low C below that G and then okay. below it to the G, okay. G and then a low D for the A. And that way you still get that nice sort of harmonic thing. Should I? Should I write it as a harmonic, the low C, or as a regular yeah. note? Uh, to... So the way you wrote the sort of diamond-headed G, I would yes. just change that to a low C. OK, great. And mm -hmm. then for the A, change that to a D. And then you're fine mm -hmm. afterwards. It's actually kind of nice. You don't have to even change fingerings for the next measure you're already on the D. You just jump down a fifth in the, in the harmonic. Oh, OK. So, yeah. Um, in general, multiphonics and harmonics, well, harmonics are completely fine on the bass flute. Multiphonics are a little mm -hmm. tricky because a lot of bass flutes, including this one, don't have trill keys, which is how we play a lot of like the weird fingerings and stuff. Uh, uh, that being said, um, the harmonics you wrote in, um, or sorry, the multiphonics you wrote in measure 6, 7, 38, 39, those work completely fine. So uh, okay. that's nice because it's just based on a low fingering. So, yeah, it doesn't right, do anything right. weird. Okay. So that's kind of great. <laughs> It's, it's always tricky because I know with other flutes, like I've worked with the quarter tone flutes where there's a whole, whole bunch of different weird multiphonics you can do with the you know, quarter tone alto flute. Yeah. But then I'm hesitant to write in anything because I know every flute is a bit different. Every yeah. flautist has a different way of doing things. So yeah. I don't know if it's if I know it's a specific person who can do a specific multiphonic on that, I can yeah. write it in as yeah. an extra thing. But uh, that's totally fair. Yeah. And yeah, the bass flute uh, in that sense, because there are some mechanism changes on the instrument. I do think there are some bass flutes that have trill keys, but don't quote me on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but this yeah, one yeah. doesn't. So there are certain things like if I wanted to even play like a super high B flat, I would have to really just overblow a lower one because it doesn't have the key that I would normally use on the C flute or piccolo or even alto flute. Um, so there are some limits in, in terms of the, the actual mechanism of it. Um, another thing that's interesting about the bass flute is that when you do harmonics or whistle tones or quarter tones, more than even on the regular flute, like it kind of brings out the instability of the tone, which is actually a really lovely thing about it. Um, I will say whistle tones are very difficult <laughs> on bass flute. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was <laughs> going to ask, yeah. It's that's hard to get a projection on it. So um, that's one thing. Because I know that, even... Know, yeah. yeah, even with the alto float, I've been told, write it really, really high yeah. and uh, don't expect it to sound very, sound really, it'll be very, very soft. Yeah, so, so like, I, again, kind of the bigger the flute, the harder it is to get a really projecting whistle tone. Um, but it was right. also really good for me to <laughs> practice my whistle tones, so. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. I got something out. Yeah, you, you did it. <laughs> um, one thing that really works well on the bass flute in general is like percussive things, especially percussive articulations mm -hmm. and stuff. It's just this giant resonant chamber. So um, with the pizzicato tonguing, it really just like explodes on it. And it's really, and so, you know, I know you're writing more movements for this. Um, and it's 
something that uh, is really fun to play around with because it does have a lot of resonance, even just the key clicks alone, but the tongue ram, it's so powerful on a bass flute um, and any percussive articulation that all comes across really well. So it's kind of something, um, it works on most flutes pretty well, but um, just to really indulge in the instrument itself, I would say, you know, you've already got a bunch of stuff yeah. like that in here, but run, run wild with it. <laughs> You know, I liked I liked very much the your tongue ramp there. Thank that you. was yeah, really got it. Yeah. <laughs> Good effect effect. And for that. I just yeah. I wanted to check with the tongue rams. The pitches you wrote are the pitches you would like to hear, right? The A G. Yes, yeah, so if that's yeah. Mm -hmm. So all I had to do was uh, play the fingering a semitone lower. For some reason, when you do tongue rams on the flute, a different pitch will come out. Usually, it's like a lower pitch or higher. Uh. Yeah. So in this case, it actually came out. I think a. a major seventh lower oh, okay. so I, I just had to change the fingerings but anyone who plays this piece should be able to figure that out um it, it may not hurt to put a little note as these are the the pitches i want to hear um, okay yeah uh, right yeah and it will sound an octave lower than written as well okay yeah okay just write that in yeah uh yeah, I mean to be kind to people, I suppose then I should I, sh I should write in the note that has to be played. But sure. if you say that, most people would know that. Yeah. So um, well, it's I, hard I, to know. Like, I yeah. no, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say, you know, I, I don't want to uh, write in things if it's sort of an un understood technique. Yeah, it's something but... that I was playing around with, and I thought I, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure when I do a tongue ram, it's going to be a different pitch, and, and so I figured out the fingering that would work, um, and. Mm -hmm. I, it may work completely differently on the C flute versus, you know, other instruments. Um, I, I really have to play around with that because not enough people write tongue rams and they are very fun to do. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, in this case, uh, it sounds pretty much an, um, um, it sounds a major seventh lower. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just transpose it a semitone lower. Uh, so you're basically getting like that really low octave. Which is okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll write in the score that that's the pitch that the sounding pitch. Yeah, and the sounding so pitch actually same. will be an octave yeah. lower than that, so you could technically put that in and then write oh, that's true, a course. little like note above it saying these are the fingers. And I can I can send you an email with like the specific fingers okay. or something if yeah. you like. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun. Um, and I was excited to see some tongue ram in here because it, again on the on the bass flute it just sounds huge and really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to just ask you about the thunderous sound growl into the flute. Oh yes. I, yeah. <laughs> I had a couple of options. Well. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. It's it sort of. I was hoping to get this feeling like okay, so here's this oak tree. Uh, that's uh, the story of the piece is it's supposed to be the sacred oak tree of the Loni, which is the oracle, and they're listening to the wheat leaves of the oak tree rustling and getting these messages from it to give people advice. Um, but then at this point of the piece, then the oak tree is being chopped down because mm -hmm. the, the, it's, the oracle is being closed down and taken over. Like so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you need some sort of... <laughs> yeah, something something daunting, I guess. Um, Scary. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there are a couple of different ways I was playing around with it. One was with voice and sustained pitch, and it was voice, flutter, and a sustained low pitch. The other one was what I kind of played the first time through, uh, which is me covering it and drumming my fingers and just blowing really fast air. So I can demonstrate both for you and you can let me know which one kind of evokes the image or if there's you know another concept that you would like me. But the first one I'll do with voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's kind of hard to do on a low note. Hold on. Or just, you know, there, there are a bunch of sort of something, something loud and aggressive, or there's a fast burst of air with the key drumming continuing from the previous measure. Uh -huh. So that's another option uh, directly into the flute. It's kind of like a more of like a frantic gust of wind, or the more mm -hmm. daunting. With or without flutter tongue, just to create something. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the the with the voice and the flutter and the sure. uh, yeah the pitch that would I think that would be uh, create the right effect. Sure. And you can yeah, I think I forgot the one. Yeah. 
Yeah, I forgot to write in Flutter Tom on one of the the parts that was flat, but you did it. So oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry, wait, yeah. why did I do that? <laughs> I just want to make sure I do it. Again. It was it was measure eighteen. I didn't write in that it was supposed to be Flutter Tom. I put the the tremolo signs, but I oh, didn't no, write I, on top. I read that as Flutter Tom, so it's okay. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. It's, it, it I should have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I should have put it on. Top. No, it's okay. Um, but yeah, another <laughs> technique that could be fun to play around with is you know the singing and playing technique because again like yes. you don't even mm -hmm. have to sing in the octave of the flute which would be hard for a lot mm -hmm. of people anyway but <laughs> definitely gives you that sort of edgy something is right. happening vibe so um and it sounds really great on the bass flute as well so it, uh, yeah no that that's great like i was hesitant to put that in because i'm not sure how comfortable uh people every like most mm -hmm. do you, would you consider that most flouters would be comfortable to put the voice sound into it they should be i mean if they're playing anything okay. with extended techniques then i think singing and playing uh -huh. is fair game um i think when okay. it gets difficult <laughs> right. is, if, is if you want them to sing a specific pitch that's not the same pitch they're playing because even i who like i like to think that i'm pretty good with these techniques if i'm have to right. sing a different pitch than what i'm playing it sometimes confuses me a little bit but if it's not so pitch specific and it's just a matter of activating mm -hmm. the voice then I mean, if anyone can do key clicks and multiphonics, then I think the voice is also fair game. And I can confirm yeah, that. That's true. Yeah, I mean, well. yeah, 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 I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... yeah. Right. Okay, that works great. great. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm always kind of hesitant as well to put a specific pitch because I'm not sure the vocal range of each. You know, everyone has a different. Yeah. But uh, I suppose you can say, well, you can choose from a few different pitches to sing. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Is you can sing a... in this octave or the octave higher. Usually, someone right, right. has a note somewhere in one of the octaves that they can sing. So, um, right, even right. if you only have a one octave range, like myself, uh, you can you can mm -hmm. usually find the pitch somewhere. So, if it's the same pitch, that's it's usually fine. I like to sing as low as I can because I find it creates a really good sort of like grumbly effect um but obviously you know everyone's built different with different voices so it's kind of a customizable technique in some ways yeah. mm -hmm. super <laughs> um i mean this this piece i was gonna ask this piece is not very long mm -hmm. um but uh you know uh, the other concern i have is to write something that's too long and with the head with the weight of the bass flute yeah. and, and uh is that I mean, I've seen some bass flutes that have a stand so that they put it on. I've heard of that. But actually. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a piece like this is only about three minutes or yeah. less, so it's not. I don't think it's really an issue. No. Uh, or if it's with if it's several movements, I suppose then mm -hmm. uh, the player could always take a a moment just to. <laughs> Just kind of resting on my shoulder. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm glad you yeah, asked right. that because that is something I wanted to bring up just in general for writing for bass flute. If you ever wanted to write, you know, a 30 minute sonata, I would kindly ask you not to. Um, yes. <laughs> because it's, it's not yeah. just like and most of it is the physical taxiness. It's ergonomically not, I mean, this is pretty well balanced, but ergonomically, it's not as safe as like a piccolo or C flute. Even alto flute sometimes pushes it. Um, in the case of a solo flute work that's multi-movement, the advantage of it being multi-movement is the flute player can actually put it down while they move pages and take their time. Um, I wouldn't okay. want to play a solo bass piece longer than 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I think like even when I'm practicing on bass flute, which I don't get to do very often, so thank you so much for, <laughs> again, writing something mm. for me. <laughs> um, but I, I had to remind myself, take a break, because it is uh, there is that challenge of the flute possibly being taxing on the upper back, the shoulders. Sometimes I'll rest the head joint on my shoulder when I'm tired. Um, right. But this, yeah. in this case, it's not an issue at all. I'm able to run this piece a few times and I feel fine, so. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, my idea was sort of, I would have, if there was more than one movement, it wouldn't be longer than mm -hmm. this particular movement. So it'd yeah. be like maybe three movements of this length to make it, but no, I'm as, because I've, uh, an alto flautist that I've worked with was telling me that, you know, how, it is much tiring playing the alto flute. Mm -hmm. And imagine if it's tiring playing the alto flute. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's even heavier with the bass. I mean, so I mean, I, I feel like, overdo it. yeah, I'm five foot 10. So for me, the bass flute just feels pretty okay. Um, but I'm also not 100% used to it because I normally don't play much bass flute. Um, and so, you know, preparing for this, I, I've been playing a lot of bass flute. And uh, I just have to remind myself to take breaks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm feeling really yeah, strong. Yeah. Uh, I don't need the gym anymore. Um, but it's, right. it is okay. definitely one of those instruments that you, you do need to be mindful of. Uh, you wouldn't want to write a long movement. Um, but if it's you know a 10 minute piece with a few movements that are all broken up, it's probably not too bad. Um, so I'm glad you, you thought about that, though. I appreciate that concern. <laughs> We're 
Oh. <laughs> so dead. But it just froze at this. Are you able to hear me? That last part, no, but it, it's okay. No, it's okay. I just wanted to say thank it's you okay. for considering this. <laughs> the ergonomics okay. Yeah, no, no, no. It's so. a, yeah. I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to uh, to work. I've never written anything specifically mm -hmm. for solo a bass flute. So I thought, wow, okay, let's <laughs> let's let's go for this. No, it's it's really fun, it and yeah, there's like uh -huh. a lot that you can do with it, and just really mm -hmm. taking advantage of the instrument's unique potential, like things that you really couldn't effectively do as well on the. the C flute or the piccolo or anything like that, being able to sort of take advantage of this very percussive, very like weirdly resonant, but also not a loud instrument, um, especially in the lower range, it's really hard to project a lot because it has this not woofy sound that sounds that sounds derogatory to the instrument, but it does have this hollow sound that actually it makes you think of like a mighty oak tree where it still has a sort of softness mm. and warmth. So uh, it's a very descriptive title and it, it matches mm. the instrument very well. But yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of delicate sounds that it can do, and it's nice to sort of exploit that a little bit, as well as you know the more intense yeah. key clicking and stuff. So yeah, um, as far as the jet whistle, I know it sounded okay to you. Was there anything you wanted to change in that? Or I think that was fine. That was uh, I think. That at that point, yeah, again, it's the the sound quality of the of this the connection yeah. here is not the greatest always. So I'm okay. uh, I'm not positive at that moment that I really heard it particularly. Mm -hmm. If I can be quite honest, <laughs> uh, the this I remember the the trill section before was very clear, and okay. then it, I think the I'm not sure if I actually really heard it very well. So, okay. Uh, um. If you'd like me to start at any measure, I'm, I'm happy to replay some things for you, try some things out. Um, I wouldn't mind actually, if it would be possible to start at the, just to, just the ending. Sure. To hear the, again, the sort of the more tumultuous uh, <laughs> sort of <laughs> crazy I, section. If, for sure. Some, I don't know if it may be like, Measure thirty-three when it's uh, something from there. Sure. Yeah, where it's the possible. trills are, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Super, thank you so much. Cool. <laughs> no, yeah, I can hear it all clearly now. <laughs> no, now I feel more relaxed. Yeah, yeah no. for just, just yeah. things too. It's fun for me. So, and, uh, so oh, the stomping great. feet, I've been doing that each time. I'm not sure how well it translates, but um, if nothing else, it's a cool thing. Yeah, that I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, that one I had done in, in an alto flute piece mm -hmm. where I had the. But it was a, <laughs> so I thought, okay, let's try it. I don't know if it's too yeah. much holding a, no. a bigger flute and, and stomping your foot. But. Were you thinking of like a more of like a sort of rhythmic yeah. stomping oh. or a shuffling? <laughs> oh, that's a good, mm. no, that's a good question. Right now uh, I've kind of just been dancing on the spot, but I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of more, not, not something particularly rhythmic. I think mm. it's sort of more chaotic. Okay. It doesn't, it's like the same thing that the actual vocal sound like that, it doesn't have to be a, uh, it's sort of more random or right. improvised sort of feeling rather okay. than a uh, although i suppose it could be uh, the sound of the, the axe you know topping the tree chop 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 yeah. it could be <laughs> actually I, I was realizing i've been making my life so hard i've been trying to stomp with two feet <laughs> just like oh no 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 yeah it's it's just 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 one one one. <laughs> so, yeah i've been making my life so much harder for myself <laughs> but it's a good workout so yeah i think um That's right. when i play the whole thing through for you all i'll try to do really loud sporadic stomps okay and great. you can let me know how you feel about that 
Um, okay. But yeah, I think that that will work well in it. Yeah, with the base flute, I mean, it's fine. Like it's balanced enough that you can kind of go willy nilly with it. So. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, and yeah, the, the I think the the quarter tones and stuff. I think they're they're coming across pretty well. It's I had to kind of. Sorry, your sound actually just cut out a little bit. I think, yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me now? No, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was happy with the quarter tones because okay, it's um, you know, it's always a tricky thing where um, I know, again, I, I've sort of got spoiled writing for the quarter tone alto flute where you know that the they can play an actual fingering for each. Yeah. And then when you get into the, uh, the other flutes, that you, it depends on how flexible uh, each mm -hmm. flautist is. But yeah. no, it's not, that sounded great. Okay, yeah, I've been using just fingerings. Um, so I, I always refer to just a random quarter tone fingering chart online. And mm -hmm. uh, and then I see, do these fingerings work or do I need to kind of make my own? So I do a little mix and match. Okay. Of, I think this works, but I think it sounds better if I put this extra finger down. And uh, right, okay. yeah, so it's, it's something, I mean, we can do pretty much any quarter tone on the bass flute. I don't want to hold, don't hold me to that. But the ones you've written are definitely good. And uh, okay, super. And, yeah, yeah, it's just a matter of like, each person figuring out the fingering that works for the flute. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm feeling very pleased, happy. <laughs> your, your, your information here. Uh, your, yeah, it's great to, to actually hear something. It's sometimes, you know, it takes so long before I actually hear anything that I've written. So it's like, wow, <laughs> getting to actually hear what I put on a, a on the page is a, yeah. It's a really great experience. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, no MIDI file can play these techniques. So you really need a human to play it. No, <laughs> no, it's it's impossible. Like, I don't even try. Like, so, you know, sometimes with strings or something, you can get a kind of a general idea. But with the flute, and the, it just mm -hmm. sounds terrible, any kind of, uh, yeah. yeah, with the effects. So it's very body involved. So um, if you'd like, I can play the whole thing through for you again. And if you have any extra notes or questions about any of the techniques that I've done, um, and we can kind of go over those. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a really fun piece and uh, I love the use of extended techniques. I'm, I'm working on the whistle tone for it. Uh, okay, no, yeah, no, yeah, that's, tricky. it doesn't have to be, like that was fine, like okay. what you did there. It was, okay. it was, it's supposed to get that sort of distant feeling, like, yeah. uh, you know, that the spirit of this poor tree has, <laughs> is coming back or something. <laughs> like, Absolutely. So, Absolutely, well, yeah. that's, that's totally fine then. Um, yeah, I can, I can just play it through unless you have anything else to... Yeah. No, no, I, I think that would be, that would be lovely. Great. Okay. I'd be, I'd be very happy.
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> so fair. Oh, no, that's great. Yeah, this is, yeah. This is my first ever solo bass flute piece to oh, play. Yeah. So this oh. is actually really fun for me. <laughs> well. <laughs> well. I actually... I'd be happy to dedicate it to you if you, oh. <laughs> if you like. I can put your <laughs> name into the school. Like my ego too big. I think actually. Anne I have a question. Works, yeah. So a question. Can you hear me right now? Uh -huh. Yeah, so. I do have a question. Um, because I, I sitting here not knowing. Um, I'm sure Sophie was briefed a little more. Um, I did hear that you were going to write other movements, and I'm wondering, um, if you could talk about that more. If you have an overall, um kind of image or idea of the piece in as, as a whole, if you could just talk about that. Um, yeah, uh, well, I was thinking it really mostly there would be um, sort of episodes that this is sort of the introduction to the to the to the to the history of this oak tree. Mm. <laughs> and then it would maybe be a particular situation for the next uh, movement or uh, where it would be uh, maybe one particular story of people going to this the Loni, this uh, oracle, to ask a particular question. I have to think about what kind of question. <laughs> What's going to happen next year? <laughs> what should I do? And then maybe a, um, a third, probably a third movement. I think probably a, a three-section piece. I don't, I don't imagine it would be longer than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, probably something about, I imagine, in each three minutes approximately in length to make it sort of more of a a full piece because this is very short to have as an actual solo piece for a you know it'd be nice to have it as a, a piece that someone could play or it could be played se separate movements of course as well Absolutely. and then i think um i like i like writing miniatures yeah so uh, then it, it they could be played as separate movements or all together as a set that was a, yeah. That's, yeah, i that's haven't come up with a whole story yeah. but uh, <laughs> it would all be about this about this it's such a beautiful location and uh sort of uh mysterious and uh, the whole sort of um, the idea of the flute representing the sound of the tree and the, the air and the, the rustling of the leaves of the cool. I, I think you're yeah nailing it so far <laughs> really like uh, yeah. a lot like, of the things <laughs> I, mean, I, I always approach i always appreciate a very descriptive um piece of music, a descriptive text mm -hmm. to look at. Um, and yeah, this actually, it falls into the fingers quite nicely and uh, it takes advantage of some really nice things about the bass flute. So hopefully I've been able to give you some ideas and, and guidance, but uh, this was a really great little uh, canvas to work from. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. you thinking about the bass flute and writing such a cool piece for it. And I see Sarah is oh, going to be the five minute uh, warning. Is there anything else you would like to discuss or? Um, no, I just want to say thank you. I mean, thank you for your for working on this and because it's uh, um, it's so difficult as a uh, to find people to collaborate with. And it, I've whenever I'm able to have some help like this, it just it makes it so much easier to get ideas. Because now, like from this, I have I can I'm starting to think. Oh, that yeah, like you said with the tongue rams and all the effects and everything, it really does work. Mm -hmm. And I feel a bit I feel more confident about uh, about writing music when I when I hear the, yeah. uh, get a bit of feedback like this. So I will just say thank you. Thank you to the CMC, of to the Canadian uh, uh, Composers <laughs> Association and the SPO. Yeah, no, well, thank you so much for, for writing this. And uh, I've learned a lot just from playing it. Because again, I don't get to do mm -hmm. a lot of bass flutes. So this is really, really educational for me as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's really great writing. So it's, it's nice to play something by you. And just, I'm sure oh, it won't so be the good. last time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll be on the hunt for more of your works. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's okay. really Great. fabulous. And uh, if you mm -hmm. have any questions about anything, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Well, my pleasure. And uh, my pleasure. And I'll look forward to listening to all the uh, to the to the next sessions. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be more bass flute to come very shortly. So. Great. Lovely. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. My thanks.
hello, welcome back. And now I'd like to welcome Diana Cotterman. Am I saying your name correctly, Nicole? Yes. Okay, good. Hello, Sophie. <laughs> yes, um, I'm Sophie Lancier. And uh, this piece that you've written is Divertimento for Flute Trio, but you're interested in adding a bass flute part or turning one of the flute parts into bass flute, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Because actually, uh, I wrote it for woodwind trio, uh, for flute, uh, oboe, and clarinet. And then uh, I wrote it in uh, 2015. And then uh, in 2018, I uh, did uh, the flute trio arrangement mm -hmm. for a Trio Taco from Victoria, from oh. British Columbia. Cool. And they played it, and I thought it was beautiful. So uh, si since then, it was uh, it was played uh, several times in uh, also in the woodwind uh, arrangement, the original one, and the the flute trio. Mm -hmm. And now I started thinking that maybe uh, the third flute could be played uh, by a bass flute, and I wanted to explore. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this possibility mm -hmm. because I wanted to have your your insight on a lot of stuff but uh, first of all uh, would it be heard uh, as much as the other two flutes would it mm -hmm. wouldn't it be unbalanced um, I don't think it would be unbalanced so I, I looked primarily at the third flute part under the assumption that was the one you were thinking about changing and I think the only time I'd be concerned about balance is whenever there's sort of like a duet happening between third flute and another flute um, and it's not even an audio balance as much as it's an octave thing um, if you want the the range to be closer for the harmonies uh, but that's really easily fixed in just turning one of the flutes down an octave or putting this one up um, but just from looking through it a lot of this would work well on bass flute and at that point it would be Kind of your decision to maybe get three flutes together and see what you actually hear in real time um, but for the purpose of today i can offer as much as i can as a single <laughs> flute player <laughs> um, but yeah there, there are certain things i'll, I'll ask you about uh, octave wise um, there's only one time it kind of goes out of the range of the bass flute um, other than that it, it sits pretty comfortably in it so it actually translates pretty nicely which is great oh, <laughs> yeah it's a really good idea um, and then a few sort of like orchestration things, but I mean, when it comes to writing for the bass flute, uh, the bass flute reads the exact same music as a regular flute. It's just a transposing instrument, so everything will come out an octave lower. But um, I, I, I don't read I don't read low ledger lines ever, unless it's like a, a low C, you know. <laughs> like don't don't ask for it. <laughs> so basically, with any flute, um, just trust the instrument itself to transpose to its octave, but you just write it as normal. Um, and yeah, so the, the range limit for the lower register is a low C. So in one place in the third flute part in measure, I think it's 61. Yeah, I think it's yes, 61. Yes, the, there are the, two, uh, I, I can uh, share my screen. Oh, <laughs> there perfect. are two uh, uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. It's bar uh, 59, 61 and then yeah. uh, 64 <laughs> i have two <laughs> two low bs yes. uh, because i i was wondering is it like on a flute or, or uh, because i know that on a student flute you just stop at uh, c but yeah. uh, on a professional flute you also have the b yeah is so it the on, same with the bass flute non-bass flute it pretty much stops at the c because it's already such a big instrument that yeah. if it had a b it would go out even further and have even less balance Oop. Sorry, the hand rest fell off. Um, <laughs> it happens a lot, don't worry. Yeah, so with the bass flute, um, I, I don't don't quote me on this, but I think it's pretty standard that it's a low C and never really a low B, just because it would be such a huge instrument. And similar with the alto flute. Uh, the alto flute usually stops just at a low C. So I would just, uh, and now low C is a really great note on this, but I would never compose below that, just because uh, usually the instrument doesn't have that range. And if it does, it's probably a very unusual bass flute. So <laughs> the, the traditional bass flute uh, stops at the low C. And then as far as the upper range goes, um, I don't personally like to play above a high A, like a really high A. Um, and when you get up to that register, it has a specific sound that it's nothing like the flute high A. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but we can, we can play around with colors and discuss that too. Um, so yeah, in, in terms of like those particular measures, you could take that entire section from 59 to 62, I think 62, um, up the octave or switch up the octave halfway through, depending on what the effect is that you want to go for. Um, 
but yeah, when when I play through any of the the bass of the third flute stuff, everything will just sound an octave lower. And yes. so at that point, it will be your decision if you want the voicing to be very far apart, or if you maybe want to adjust some of the first or second flute to move it lower, or the bass flute to be higher, just to make them a little bit closer. But that's entirely up to you. It would be interesting, I think, to have it developed mm -hmm. on more ranges, uh, you know, to it would be richer maybe yeah yeah but uh, um, this brings me to another question um i i love the lower range on a flute mm -hmm. <laughs> and, I, uh, and i know that uh, you know if it's not a solo uh, you know you, you never put that into an orchestration because it, it will never <laughs> be heard uh, about yeah. you yeah you'll likely never hear it um oh, did we freeze again i think we may have frozen i'm sorry Hopefully it gets back soon. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the bass flute, uh, if it's in a chamber music ensemble mm -hmm. or in a solo piece, um, what could you tell me about uh, how, how it would sound? Can, can I... I? I can demonstrate you know, can some I... things if you'd like. Um, yeah, so it, when it's in a flute ensemble is when it's the most useful or as a solo instrument just because it doesn't it doesn't have a lot of volume but it has like a very warm sound it's almost like uh if you were to do a pizzicato on a double bass it's not necessarily yeah. loud but it has this warmth and roundness to it so in a flute ensemble in particular uh, it's not competing with anything in the lower register so it kind of provides that grounding itself um but if i were to just you know do c major scale going down <laughs> want to play that note very short because it kind of goes a little bit it's hard to get a very clear attack but it does um, if I were to play from uh, even just from measure nine of the uh, score not overpowering sound by any means the other instruments would actually stand out clearly still um, the only time that I would I mean it's nice to have it paired with other voices as kind of a duet uh, because I know you wrote a lot of things like that uh, there are times in this particular movement um, when there's a, did you know the do term dovetailing sort of like passing yeah. along yeah yeah so it may get a little bit interrupted if the octave isn't different um, than as playing, for example, 38, the, well, I can't play it on this, but the flute has the A to F, and then the third flute has, like, completing the arpeggio. Um, it would be basically like an octave and a half jump down for the rest of it. Oh, our sound cut off, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I don't know if you heard me. Oh, yeah, sorry, would you mind repeating that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I, I said that it's something that I love doing when composing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like spreading an arpeggio uh, from one instrument to the other. Uh, for me, it's like, you know, opening a fan yes. or, uh, you know, an accordion or <laughs> something. <laughs> I, I, I love this. So, so I love it too. Uh, that part is from, uh, it's yeah. a bit from the. Uh, yeah, and so at that stage, because um, I agree, I love the sort of passing of notes. So it would depend if you would want to keep them in sort of, because where the F in the first flute ends, the third flute, in this case, bass flute, would pick up at a low C. So it'd be over an octave. And so it may, and this is entirely like up to you, depending on what you want, but it may disrupt the flow of this sort of fan opening if there's like a really yeah. big octave change. But that can Drop, basically yeah. be... Yeah, that can easily be changed if you just either move the first flute lower or the third flute an octave higher. Or at that point, you could also switch third and second flute material. So the, the third flute ends up just playing a nice... Um, so the third flute could technically just take over 
the sort of pedal tone, and then you keep that dovetailing, but between the first and second flute instead of first and third flute. Um, yeah. So you don't lose that sort of quality. Um, so there are a few different options. If you keep it in the bass flute, I would say just change the octave so it's a little yeah, bit so closer. Yeah, so an octave higher. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I'll go with that option. <laughs> cool, yeah. It's nice to not have to change everything, right? So I, I think that's one of the options you can work with. Either move the bass flute higher or the first flute lower, um, depending on, you know, your preference and what, what your vision is. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a, actually a thought about that too. Um, just as like another option, um, is that maybe you can even overlap the the parts. So you know the the it would start in one flute, and then you'd have the bass flute join for a few notes in octave, and then as the higher flute fades out, you're left with the sound of the bass flute continuing, and it wouldn't be as as jarring of like a you know it wouldn't be like jumping but it'd be kind of a combination hopefully you can hear me right now a combination of tones mm -hmm. and and and, sh and you know as the the c flute peters out then you're left with the tone of the bass flute that's a good maybe another also like another option <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to it's try like to take advantage <laughs> of this extended range mm -hmm. by passing these things through and obviously that means you would you would probably have to change the second flute part but uh the idea of if you wanted to take advantage of this extended range then you know you kind of work your way through the C flute range, and then when it, that gets a little bit too low, the bass flute kind of takes over. So that's one of the far, one of the fun parts about um, the bass flute in the realm of flute is it really does kind of just extend the range if you want to mm -hmm. do a you know, flute ensemble thing. Um, but yeah, that's something but, else uh, you could go, go talk Sophie, about. Yeah. is it uh, as agile as a flute would be? So, um, you know, for the third movement wh where the theme are faster, the first theme is faster, yes. uh, can it be played uh, uh, without worry on a bass flute? In this case, yes. I would always caution people, don't write anything extremely technical on bass flute because every time you lift your fingers, it does kind of change the balance of the instrument and it can be a little difficult. Um, one thing about the bass flute, and this also could be because I don't play nearly as much bass flute as I do other flutes, but I do find um, intervals, big wide intervals, aren't always reliable as far as aiming. If you wanted to do something very fast with articulation or big intervals, it's not as easy for sure. Uh, the bass flute doesn't like that, but for that theme you're talking about, sorry. <laughs> So it's still plenty um, agile, and actually, I, I was having fun practicing that part because it works well. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't change that unless if it didn't sound as balanced, then you could consider it. But um, in this scenario, it's completely fine to play. Uh, okay. Yeah, I wanted to say because I yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, I would love keeping it uh, on the bass flute mm -hmm. because uh, when I'm writing the chamber music and when I'm writing orchestral mu music. I'm always uh, trying to distribute uh, interesting stuff to <laughs> all instruments, to, yeah. to have all these dialogues. Uh, because I, I, I remember when I was uh, beginning my career as a violinist, I, I was in an opera orchestra in my hometown in Romania. And uh, when we, I was in the first violin, so I, uh, the flute and <laughs> us, we always had the, the themes. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, the comments from uh, the bassoonists or w when we played the uh, operas by Puccini, or uh, they were so happy they had stuff, yeah. uh, interesting stuff to do. Yeah. So it stayed with me. And I'm, uh, I'm always trying when I compose to, to, to give a moment of glory <laughs> to each and every one. And when yeah. it's chamber music, uh, what fascinates me is to, to have uh, this perpetual dialogue, so mm. uh, not just, uh, you know, you, one, one instrument is the star and the other ones, yeah. uh, they're, uh, you know, uh, yeah. helping him. Yeah, uh, the supporting her. actress, yeah. Yes, no, exactly. I, yeah, I actually, um, I, I'm glad you said that because I think in this particular piece, the way the third flute part is written, it, it lends itself to that for bass flute. So all the agile things in the last movement are absolutely fine for bass okay. flute. Um, so I, I honestly, looking through it, there's very little I would 
want to change. And of course, like I haven't played this with two other flute players to think blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, it's it, what sounds good to you as the composer. Um, but just from a bass flute perspective, if someone handed me this and said, just play the third flute part on bass, I wouldn't have an issue with it. Uh, I think it would work well. It's more just, you know, whenever there are duets between third flute and someone else, that's when it, you think, um, oh, do I want the octaves to be super far apart? Will that sort of disrupt the harmony? Do I want them closer? And that's kind of a, a matter of taste and um, going through it and experimenting and seeing. For example, sometimes the third flute part might do a harmony with someone and the third flute is technically higher. Um, but when it's put on bass flute, all of a sudden it's actually lower. Yes. So um, that's something that, you know, it's worth kind of looking into and seeing what, what works. Uh, I wanted to just point out because uh, playing through it, the second movement, the, the third flute part is awesome on bass flute. Like, completely, <laughs> like I don't know if you, if you want to hear it or not, but it's, it, I, I kind of want to play it for you. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really, really good for bass flute um, because it goes up into the higher register, which actually projects very nicely, but it doesn't push it. Because I wouldn't want to play much higher than this, but uh, it's still a very lyrical, beautiful register. So, and there are a lot of solos, so it's a good opportunity to show off the bass flute. Um, so I'll, I'll play a little bit, and you can let me know what you think of it. Um. <laughs> It's, it's amazing on a bass flute. I know. I, I wanted to make sure you heard that because it works so well on bass flute and it goes into such a unique solo register. Because the bass flute in ensemble, its job in a flute ensemble is to play all the low things. Yeah. But it does have this amazing ability to be agile and do these runs um, within reason, of course. Uh, if it was something very, you know, big intervals and disjunct, then it wouldn't be as easy. Uh, but. It also, you probably notice, even though it's technically an octave lower than written, it still has the, the colors of a higher voice, almost like a falsetto. Yeah. And so it, it really does almost feel like a little aria for the bass flute. Um, and I, I think you would, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you would really enjoy this in that context, um, just because it has that unique color and it really showcases this instrument. Um, so I know I... I <laughs> I was using this as my warm up actually, because it really allowed me to just get my air going. So uh, I just wanted to point out that that part works very well on the, the bass flute. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm glad you have this in mind. <laughs> the, the, that is great because, uh, as I told you originally, it was uh, the third flute, mm -hmm. was the clarinet part. And uh, I love the the different uh, colors that you have in the th uh, three registers mm -hmm. of the clarinet. So uh, I, I'm very happy to be able to, to find something uh, similar mm -hmm. for the bass flute because yeah. I, uh, it, it really is, is pretty, pretty different as colors when you go from one register to one range to the other. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful surprise because I, I've never heard this part played on a, 
bass flute just on the three flutes. Yeah, no, so, it's, uh, it's like it was written for bass flute all along. <laughs> but really, like th that's what's really great about this instrument is it does have so many different colors, kind of like a clarinet. When you're going into the different ranges, it's like almost a different instrument completely. Yes. Um, but there's always that sort of connection between ranges. But uh, the lower range obviously has this warmth and groundedness that you don't expect to hear from a flute. Um, but the higher range even though we don't use it nearly as much on bass flute because we typically don't need to, it's, it usually serves the purpose of extending a range for the other flutes. Uh, it does have a remarkable amount of um, resonance and projection that is harder to do in the lower register because it's so easy to just overblow a note and then it doesn't speak at all, uh, which has been the majority of the last two weeks for me, <laughs> is trying to figure <laughs> out how do I get a consistent low note. Um, but yeah, so uh, for solo things, uh, it works really, really nicely, but also just getting that contrast of, of ranges. Um, so it's, it's worth playing around with and, you know, future bass flute compositions you may look into. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it works very, very nicely. So I, I just want to make sure you, you heard it in context and it gives you an idea of the, the scope of the instrument as well. Yes, because I, I was wondering about uh, the, the high range. Uh, uh, because I know for, for the flute, it's where you have the uh, the most brilliant sound, yeah. and uh, so so uh, I was wondering w w what does it give on a bass yeah. flute? Well, I mean, I can I can play some high notes. It's definitely not going to be as warm or as brilliant. It, it almost has a somewhat muffled sound. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but. Um... <laughs> It definitely sounds like it's at the top of its range. Um, it doesn't. It's not too tiring to actually play from a, a performer standpoint, but it, it sounds like it's almost at a limit. If that makes sense, there's like a lot of extra noises and things that come out, which is cool if that's the effect you want. But it's very different from the C flute. Yeah, but, uh, this is what's interesting. Uh... On one hand, you hear it's from the flute family, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, it's so different uh, as a color. Uh, it sounds so um, so different. <laughs> it's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's very startling for me. Whenever you know, I'm so used to playing piccolo and flute and alto flute from time to time. Uh, so putting this in, you know, it's the same fingering, it's the same kind of concept, but all of a sudden, this completely different sound comes out. Uh, which is kind of the, the magic of the bass flute in many ways, is that it has these amazing capabilities to just create a completely different sound than what you expect. And it, it definitely creates a lot of contrast. And again, like it depends on when it comes to the duets in this, if you want these completely different colors or if you want them to sit in similar voices. Um, so if you want the contrast in voices in terms of the timbre of the sound and the quality of the sound, then obviously the bass flute would provide that. Um, but if you want it more almost like an organ where you press two keys and it's the same color but different pitches, then it's better to keep it kind of between the, the two upper flutes. Um, but of course, that's a matter of practice and experimenting. In an ensemble, uh, it would work um, like, uh, for, for instance, let's say we'd have a note on the flute and the same note, uh, an octave uh, lower on the bass flute to, to create like a, a surround e effect, like mm -hmm. a layering effect. Yeah. Or, or e even if they were playing in unison, mm -hmm. uh, it, it would bring um, a, a second layer, more uh, enveloping, more uh, warm. Yeah, and actually that's what I was thinking, looking at um, measure 59 to 62, I believe, uh, where you have, uh, eventually it splits into three octaves. Um, but it can start in three octaves and then actually just kind of stay there if you take the second half of it and for the third flute part and move it up the octave just to make it playable. <clears throat> but um, if I'm reading it just as printed, but then in measure 60, I'll just take some of it up the octave. So. Yeah. essentially doing exactly what's in the flute two line uh, and so the entire time it will be in octaves it just will be written exactly the same as the flute two line yeah mm -hmm. uh, 
I think uh, I, I'll share my screen. Sure, yes, uh, I think that you know you, you could pass uh, on the higher octave, uh, you know, uh, here. La la la, see me coming, know me. Well. I'll write it down yeah, <laughs> for, so for later. Underneath this part, I just wrote octave with a question mark because I figure you'll probably have a decision somewhere where you would want to change yes. the octave, and it's a matter of where. Um, and of course, that's entirely up to you. But yeah, it's only because the the bass flute can't play a low B. <laughs> if it could, then it would work, but at the same time, it would also be two octaves below the second flute. So that would be quite a stark difference, um, orchestration-wise, yes. for such small orchestration yeah well, or i could uh, you know put the first flute on piccolo yeah. you know really widen it uh, yeah, just have it symmetrical yeah. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. that's not a bad idea <laughs> that's an excellent <laughs> but yeah yeah there's there's plenty of um options as far as octaves and you know I, again even like when i'm looking at measure 46 where the bass flute or the third flute provides sort of the the root of the chord um, or in this case, it's the fifth, but the, the bass line, um, you can either keep it in that octave, which works well, or if you want it to sound more cohesive in terms of range, then you just put it up the octave. But again, that might be something you actually experiment with, with a full flute trio, just to see what actually makes sense. Um, but those are like little things, uh, that is just to consider, I guess, because everything will sound the octave lower, but you don't have to physically write anything differently for the bass flute it'll, you just be aware that it will sound different when it's played um but that's what's nice is i don't have to read different music everything always yeah. looks the same to me so <laughs> i let the instrument do the work not me <laughs> um but yeah uh, i'm looking through some of the other parts again most of this i think would stand alone as and again once you hear it in context you may think oh i kind of wish this was different or you know that kind of thing even at 54 55, 56 in the first movement. You may or may not uh, want to keep this and because it is sort of taking from the first flute, but again, uh, with the passing between things, for the sake of cohesion, you can either, ch sorry, the second flute, you can either change it to first and second flute uh, instead of having the bass flute do some of these things just to make sure it sounds unified or change octaves or leave it as is. So there are plenty of options available yeah. to you without having to change too much. <laughs> no, I, I don't mind changing, but I, I think mm -hmm. that uh, you are definitely right. Uh, hearing uh, an ensemble playing it uh, would give me, uh, uh, you know, a better insight into what works and uh, where it just uh, goes, uh, you know, drops on, on the lower end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you, you, you don't want to lose that beautiful sort of fanning effect of the passing things. And so I can't tell you for sure if you would lose that. Because um, I probably should have tried recording this by myself just to see what it would actually <laughs> sound like. Um, I thought about doing that. I actually did that for the very opening just to see, is this too low? And it, it seemed fine. So uh, when it comes to chords and things like that, that you know, it's entirely up to you. It's, it's really nice to have that deep bass note. Um, but when it comes to the interplay of notes, that's when it's worth considering, do I keep it in the bass flute and just change some octaves, or do I move it to first and second flute and use the bass flute more as like a grounding bass mm -hmm. instrument, um, which may work better just because you get to sort of exploit the instrument's bass, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Um, also because even if it is in a similar range, it, the color is so different, um, which I, I suppose is actually okay because this was written for three different instruments. Yes, first, yes. So. <laughs> uh, but it, it entirely depends on your, your preference. Uh, just know that uh, the octaves on the bass flute, even if it's the same octave as the flute, has a very different color, just given the nature of the instrument. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still agile enough to play most of this anyway, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah. th this is what uh, worried me. Yeah, uh, no, but okay. uh, uh, I think it would sound way better uh, with uh, two flutes and the bass flute mm -hmm. uh, instead of the three flutes because uh, I was thinking um, th there wasn't enough difference between uh, you know the the second flute and the third mm -hmm. flute and the the yeah. third flute uh, you know is uh, almost all the time uh, in the yeah. lower range. <laughs> no, I totally so understand. It's like who's playing what at this point, right? But it is kind of nice. Like even if I think about 
Beethoven's fifth when the bassists all of a sudden get to do their own variation and it's just something that the ear goes oh that changed that's someone else now so um and yeah also because it is a flute and it's still agile and this is so such nice smooth motion it's not giant intervals so it works perfectly fine um yeah i can <laughs> So yeah, it works. It works really nicely, um, and it's nice to hear the theme in someone else's voice. You know, so yes. yeah, uh, that's not a concern at all. You can keep it pretty much exactly as is. Okay, great. And uh, I was wondering about uh, uh, advanced techniques uh, because I uh, I was listening to, to what you told uh, Corinne, to what uh, you were discussing. Uh, so I heard about the flutter tan, yeah. uh, uh, which is a technique that I love using. I, I didn't use it here in the divertimento, uh, but for, for the orchestral pieces, uh, I, I love using that. And I was wondering about the... Uh, you know the aeolian sounds uh, oh, yeah. you know on, on the bass flute mm -hmm. yeah so it's it's very similar to if you're to write it for any other instrument aeolian sounds on piccolo are always a little bit weird because the piccolo doesn't have a lot of resonating space so yes. the bigger the flute the more effective they actually are um, <laughs> or fully blowing into the tube <laughs> which you don't really get as much pitch. Um, the, the tricky part about bass flute, and same with alto flute, and you know, again, the bigger the flute, <laughs> the trickier it is for air control, because you use more and more air, there's less and less sort of resistance. Whereas on the piccolo, I can get my longest phrases on the piccolo without breathing, because it's small, it doesn't use, it, it uses amount, a good amount of air, but there's some sort of resistance to it. So if you ever you know, wrote a very long extended note on the bass flute, it would be a little bit tricky given the fact that it's a little bit harder to sustain um, <laughs> air-wise. And I like to think I have pretty good air control, but um, so that's just one thing to consider. Uh, it's not an issue at all in this piece. Um, but for Aeolian Aeol sounds, um, it's, uh, it's also up to the performer how focused they want to make the sound, but um, it has a lot of capabilities, and again, it's such a resonant instrument that you can have a lot of fun with these tones. Oh, I think we froze a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> like that part we froze. <laughs> so much bigger. I, I, I think uh, I think this sound effect, uh, the airy ones, the Aeolian ones, um, I don't know, but I, I think it sounds better even than on a flute. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, uh, yeah. I, I hear it, uh, I, I, you know, uh, into a more complex way. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Again, there's just more place for the air to pass through. So, um, um, there's, there's some flute choir pieces you may want to check out. Um, one by Ian Clark called Within. I think it's called within um and it's a flute choir so it has bass flute piccolo alto flute regular flute and he uses a lot of air sounds um i played this piece like nine or ten years ago <laughs> it's been a while but uh it's it utilizes because he ian clark himself is a flute player um and so he knows the instrument very well and he use, utilizes the air sounds and i remember trying to get the air sounds on c flute and i was okay at it but the person playing bass flute was able to really capture this whoosh of sound so um if ever you are really committed to wanting a very heavy sort of aeolian sound using a larger flute like the alto or the bass um, will probably give you a bigger effect especially if you want it to be heard you know several rows away <laughs> um, yeah. but yeah the bass flute is really really great for that yeah, and for the per percussive sounds i thought that they were really neat also <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so again i one thing that I used to not like about this instrument is how loud the keys are, but now that I play so much contemporary music, it actually serves the music yeah. very well. So you can do a lot of things like that, and uh, you don't have to press down as hard on the keys as you would on the flute, so it feels less damaging. Um, but yeah, the percussive things with key clicks, uh, it's really fun. Pitched key clicks, sometimes it works well, it depends on the note, but if you just look at a fingering chart, 
and you see which which notes require more finger sound, you'll get more of like a pitch sound. But if you're just looking for some sort of rustling rustling leaves, uh, like in Corrine's piece, then this actually uh, is a really great piece, a uh, great instrument for it. Um, and then with percussive articulation, you know, sort of a pizzicato style, or slap tongue, or a little bit of beatboxing. Like you can, you can do a lot of really, really cool things with this. Um, as long as the, the performer themselves is up to it. <laughs> so uh, the instrument itself is really great if you have someone who's um, comfortable with these techniques. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've missed the, the last minute. Uh, oh, I'm so what sorry. I'm so sorry. Basically, no problem. I, it's okay. I, I listened to it afterwards uh, on YouTube. Just to summarize, basically, uh, when it comes to different types of articulation and techniques, if you're able to find you know, a flute player who can beatbox, then this is an amazing instrument for that because, again, it's such a resonant instrument and it, it, it really works well for percussive things. So, yeah. But, uh, you know, I actually love when there are all, all these... Uh these sounds, uh, extra sounds, I'm, I'm never trying to, to hide them in violin mm -hmm. uh, either, because uh, I'm working a lot with... Uh, oh, sorry, your audio cut out for a minute. Great. So what I said is that uh, I'm actually looking for all these extra sounds mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, as a composer with a low budget, <laughs> I <laughs> use a lot of uh, virtual instruments that I mix with uh, the violin and the viola mm -hmm. that I record myself. Uh, and uh, in all these, uh, you know, uh, virtual instruments, you don't have all these extra sounds. Mm -hmm. And this, for me, it's one of the things that brings authenticity. Uh, and of course, all the, you know, the, the interpretation that only a human can do. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when, when I hear, you know, the, the, the sound uh, of, uh, you know, the, the per percussive sound when you yeah. press the key, you know, I, I, I find it that it's a really nice accompaniment to, to the music. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I agree with you. There's sort of this human touch that can't be replicated. And so yes. that brings this like natural element to the music itself. And you know, yeah, the instruments make noise. That's why they're fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's why, you know, composers can take advantage of the noises and, and actually use them for depicting something. Um, and extended techniques, of course, when it comes to bass flute, there, there are plenty of options, but um, my favorite ones are always the more percussive, either with the actual mechanism or with my mouth. Um, because it, it just works so well. It's, it's nice and noisy, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like a piece of plumbing, but it really, it, uh, it is, <laughs> it's a nice noisy instrument for that. And, uh, it, I would say, and I, my favorite instrument will always be the C flute, but this does it better than the C flute in many ways. There's just so many possibilities with this instrument. So I love the pitch band when you did it earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It's hardest on the bass flute. Um, essentially, I was trying to figure out the science behind it <laughs> via Google, um, but essentially, <laughs> you know, the longer the tube, uh, including when all the fingers are pressed down, the less likely you will be to have a really good pitch bend. Um, it's a little bit more reluctant to changing. Um, for example, if you had a flute trio, they should tune to the bass flute because the bass flute is gonna be the instrument that kind of stays at its pitch. Um, okay. Whereas with piccolo, you can bend it all over the place. It's a tiny instrument, and so that's why it's hard to play in tune <laughs> often on piccolo. <laughs> it's because it has so many possibilities. So on the bass flute, if ever you write a pitch bend, it's hard to do them upwards because we don't have any holes in the keys to sort of slide. Um, yeah. But downwards pitch, pitch bends, especially if there's a decrescendo, um, about a semitone at the most. So it's, it's fair game, <laughs> but downwards is much easier than upwards on this instrument. And, and you said the slower also. Yeah, so I wouldn't want to go like really, really fast, especially <laughs> the pitch bends, because it is a big instrument. And so it's a lot more large movement than if it were to just be, you know, um, like even a regular flute, I can move back and forth quicker. 
than I can a bass flute. So the sort of the ergonomics of the instrument, it, it's, yeah. it, I can do it, but I like to have a little bit of time to do it. <laughs> so. And for the harmonics, because I, I love using uh, harmonics uh, on the string instruments, mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering uh, about the bass flute. Can, can you play a few harmonics again? Sure. So harmonics in terms of um, like taking a note and then overblowing it to get a higher partial of the note. So if I were to take a low C. <laughs> You, you can hear that there's some sort of underlying extra tone. Um, and sometimes if you have a certain, you can actually get more than one tone at the same time. So it's sort of the multiphonic. Um, yeah. So any harmonics that you do on the flute more or less translate to the bass flute. Um, and they work best with low, low register fingerings that you just blow higher. Um, in terms of multiphonic, so more than one note at the same time, it's a lot more limited just because we don't, well, in this particular case, this bass flute doesn't have any of the trill keys that the normal flute would have. Um, and again, I think there are bass flutes that do have trill keys, but for the sake of just assuming everyone has a very simple bass flute, then I would, I would shy away from multiphonics for the most part, except for on low notes. <laughs> get some really cool notes and all I did was I just took a low C and overblow but no special fingerings because the fingering system is a little bit reduced on this instrument yeah 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 great can can I please ask you to to play again the the beat you know from the second movement yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> you know it stopped uh, right in the beginning and I've heard the the half the yeah. second half part of it okay uh hopefully it doesn't stop again <laughs> but i'm happy <laughs> yeah. to play it as many times as you need me to thank you <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely it's so lovely I, as soon as i played through it cause i thought oh, i wonder how it's going to work on bass flute as soon as i played through it, i thought it, well now you have no choice it has to be on bass flute <laughs> you know? um, and one thing to consider is that in measure 83 technically it will be lower than the first flute once it's actually played together um, that being said you could also put in a different dynamic marking for the first flute and you know make sure that you still have the bass flute as the dominating sound, which I don't think will be too difficult. It's a pretty resonant register, um, but it's just something to consider as far as the voicing. Technically, the top voice would actually be the first flute. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, this is because when I wrote it, I wanted the, the clarinet to also have uh, something in their uh, yeah. higher register. Yeah. And uh, then when I put it uh, for, for three flutes, mm -hmm. uh, I thought so. Let's uh, let the third flute also have their moment, yeah. <laughs> you know, in heavens, because they're all the time, you know, yeah. 
so so now for the bass flute i was very curious to hear uh, uh, how it sounds and uh, and i think that i will leave it like this because uh, it has a very beautiful color uh, in the higher uh, range yeah. I, I just hope it, it won't be covered by uh, by the I flute i think it'll be okay it sounds uh, i'm just asking Anne, who's also in the room it sounds like it projects pretty nicely and if you're worried about it being covered you could write in a softer dynamic marking for yes. the other flute and you know just make sure that whoever's playing this is aware that this is still the bass flutes moment so you know you're, you're with them, but you're not on top of them. So. Yeah, it, it sounds like really beautiful mm -hmm. up there, I think. And so, yeah. yeah, as long as everyone else is aware of that. Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the timbre of the, the sound itself, I think is distinct enough to stand out. Um, mm. Especially if you use a lot of vibrato like I just did, <laughs> it wins, you know? But yeah, because the color itself is so um, distinct, I think it will stand out, uh, but if you're concerned about it, you know, you work with dynamic markings and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be too worried about it being covered in this case, given the range and capabilities of the instrument. So if it was low, I'd be a bit more concerned, but it's not. Yes. So you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think. Uh... Yeah, I think I, uh, <laughs> I've asked all my questions. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, if you can just, I don't know, play a few beats where um, where the bass flute has uh, the the melody, like in, in bar twenty five or in bar forty two. You know, just to hear how how it sounds. Sure. Yeah, I can uh, do twenty five, and then I'll stop after that, and I'll move to forty two. Great. And then again. So I, it does stand out well uh, in that lower register because not much else is happening. Um, yes. until the second flute comes in, but, you know, the second flute could always come in an octave lower or, you know, see what it sounds like as is and, you know, make those decisions after. Yeah, uh, anyway, I think uh, there on the 42, uh, yes, it's the, it's the second flute that uh, takes a little bit uh, the, the relay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> See what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I don't mind if uh, the bass flute is heard a little bit uh, lower okay. underneath. But for uh, uh, as you said earlier, that um, you know you you, you can't have uh, big uh, phrases on the same breath. Yeah, is it good for for that one? Yeah, I mean there are plenty of places I can sneak a little breath. So um, it like I wouldn't I I think my limit for some of this would be maybe two measures at a time but i try to breathe so that the phrase itself doesn't go away you know <laughs> like i breathe within the phrase try to breathe within the phrase but um <laughs> that way you know it doesn't go flat it doesn't get uncomfortable i, I do have to take that breath um but i don't think it's too disruptive uh, especially because okay. you know the, the second flute also comes in so it, it work, actually works really nicely to just take a breath so it yeah. starts again with that I'm always uh, singing the phrases that I write for uh, for wind instruments mm -hmm. as I don't play. I, I have an oboe, but my family can tell you that <laughs> everybody runs away when I'm starting uh, practicing my scale. Okay. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm always trying uh, to, to sing to see if I can do it on one breath. Mm. I'm thinking that maybe a professional uh, wind player <laughs> could also uh, do it. So it's my, a little bit my measure for yeah. uh, for the phrases. Yeah. I I mean that's a, that's a good sort of way to pace it out um but then considering with the bass flute it just uses so much air uh especially if you really tr want to get that lower register higher notes i find don't take as much air it feels like there's more resistance but that's why you know sm smaller flutes are easier to play for a longer time um so with the bass flute that's just something to consider for any future yeah. writing it doesn't really concern me in this particular piece you know you just take little quick breaths here and there and you know sort it out 
Um, but yeah, the bass flute uh, definitely uses a lot of air. Um, <laughs> it's funny, when I play the bass flute and then I play the C flute afterwards, I'm like, where did my bass go? <laughs> yes. It's air for days. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge for sure. And um, obviously singing it, you'd probably be able to sing longer than I could play on the bass flute. Whereas on normal flute, normal flute, C flute, yeah. uh, it's, it's not as much of a concern. So mm -hmm. um, that's just like a little thing to think about for yeah, these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Sophie, thank you so much for, thank you. For, for, for everything. It's such a pleasure to, 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 to hear you play and to hear you explaining. And it helped me a lot uh, into, you know, having a clearer picture of wh what I could do and uh, what I should do <laughs> on the bass flute and what I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's really not a whole lot to change. It's all a matter of like, how do you envision this sounding and do you want these octaves different and all that. But um, I think it's, it's a really good starting block to just add bass in there and see what happens. So um, I think we may have frozen again. Hopefully not. Yeah, but, but I can hear you. Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I, I think um, it's a really awesome piece to put bass in and sort of play around and see how it works and then kind of like, you know, get more experimental with it going forward. Uh, but it's also just a beautiful trio. So thank you so much oh, thank for you. this here. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Sophie. Goodbye. Thank, thank you all.
thanks to Sophie for the two wonderful workshops um, earlier. Um, I have with me Camille Belair. Is that how? Is that right? Okay, great. Camille Belair, who wrote a wonderful um, piece called Book Piece. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. Um, and yeah, this is like I I love this, and I did read your notes, and you were saying you had this performed before, where the artists wrote. So so the concept is that you draw or create your own score and um, perform it. And you, you've had a situation where the artists um, did do the, the visual part on stage. Is that right? And this for this workshop, I was going to make my own score at home, uh, which I did. And um, so I can show you what I did. I made a, I made a few or just like a well, three, I guess, um, just so I could see how um, the scores like would fold up using different papers. So here I did um, just, I hope you, you can see this. It's just paper, like regular paper with pencil. Can you see that? Yeah. It's super blown out, but I can, I can okay. see the... Here, wait, maybe I can... Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so cool. I did I did one like that because I just, you know, this is probably like the most standard what people would have. And then I did uh, like a double-sided one. So, um, and this is more on like watercolor, mm. a mixed media paper. And um, I drew it with pencil. And then my partner actually w w has been getting into watercolor. So we both kind of um, collaborated on the color part. Um, and put a little bit of ink on it. And one side, I'll come up and show you in a second, but one side was more of um, imagining a um, kind of like a visual language, which I think is the wording you used yeah. in your score. So a visual language. And then the other one, I kind of just drew, I, I, so I was recently in Florida actually, and I kind of drew images of the things that I experienced in Florida and just have like a different interpretation, like see how that would come out. And I really like how you, it's, it's interesting because you draw first and then you make the book. So you, what, whatever you you're thinking of when you draw it, it's going to come out differently, right? Once mm -hmm. you fold it up, which I really love that. So I'm going to just show you what I did here. So. Oh yeah. Cool. There's that, and then here's this. <laughs> There's like an alligator. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so um, I don't know. We can, I can. Um, for, for some reason, the audio cut on my end, just for a sec there. Okay. Um, I was just going to say, I can either play this for you. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, there there we go. Now okay, back, yeah. okay, great. Back, yeah. So um, we can do this. Uh, we can either talk about it a little bit first, or I can play through you know one of these if you'd like and then we can talk and then we can talk and then i can yeah. maybe play another one yeah uh, maybe um yeah maybe starting with the performance would be helpful to kind of structure structure sure. things yeah i think that's a great idea so and i kind of assumed it wasn't there isn't a particular order right like once the book's folded is there isn't like a page that needs to go first no it? like you can kind of play around with what what could be the front but that's also kind of up to the performer yeah. okay great so i'm gonna play the so the um side with the just the the kind of the lines and textures so that's the that's the what i'm gonna start with awesome
Yeah, it was awesome. I love so many of those techniques that you were using. Sweet. Cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, maybe you... Um, oh, it just, just cut out again on oh, my end. <laughs> sorry. Let um, me know when you can now, hear me. Now it's frozen. Uh -oh. um, I don't know if you can hear me on, on that end. But, I uh, can hear you. Let me know when you can hear me. We also um, have a question from the chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, for the composer, but we can wait until the connection's a little bit more solid. Sure. Oh, yeah, it's very frozen now. Yeah, it's okay. 
Okay, I'm hearing. Okay, here now we're back. Okay, okay, <laughs> back. great. Um, we actually have a question in the chat for you um, okay. from Jay Marsh. Uh, could we know what the impetus from the composer that Anne was drawing to? What's the premise here? Right. So um, I know I, I sent the file. So maybe the the score could be shared on screen in the. Um... Oh yeah, is that possible? Okay. They will work on. Um, that. But I guess in general, I want. I've been getting. I've been into bookbinding for about a decade now. It's sort of just like a hobby on the side, and I've been getting more and more interested in exploring visual arts and kind of. I do. A lot, I'd like to do a lot of abstract art, and it, it, I guess just the way that that I do. I do that. I, I get to thinking, wow, like this. This could be something interesting for myself to explore, a, an alternative way to kind of play around with different soundscapes, even and like look at form and without the kind of structure of an actual musical score mm -hmm. and to just kind of trying to develop some way of maybe connecting that casually and kind of intuitively to well this could be a very interesting way of um kind of playing around with different textures or like being able to visualize things in a certain way without having to put a bunch of stuff together like in a recording software because um, i like to work a lot with um like sound scapes and field recordings and that kind of stuff and at this at least at this stage in my composition practice um and I was getting to think, well, this is interesting when it comes to like doing graphic scores. And I know a lot of different composers like to have a very, especially within like electroacoustic music, like a very structured way of like this symbol means this very explicit thing, and this other symbol means this. And there's all it becomes this very kind of like almost mathematical way of plotting music. Um, and I guess approaching graphic scores myself, I kind of reached this point of wondering, well, like I'm not super interested in coming up with some unique musical language and trying to force performers to figure out. What all of this stuff is, I think it'd be kind of, I think it would be kind of interesting to see, because all say for me, like all of this art that I'm doing is very personal, and I kind of understand what's going on, like what another performer would would use, or like would do in that kind of a situation, and then to incorporate bookbinding, because a lot of my compositional practice for like instrumental music, I'm a classical guitarist, and I was writing a lot of post solo repertoire mm -hmm. and other like really really minimal repertoire for smaller chamber chamber ensembles, it was getting like more and more and more minimal and kind of form based to the extent that at a certain point, like I wouldn't have bar lines anymore, everything was very, very open. And at a certain point, it's like, you could either go in in a more traditional um, notation practice and try to just add even more details and more and more and more instructions to just to try to get something very, very specific. Or I've been working with trying to find an alternative, like using text scores to try and just describe or give it basic instructions that will probably have a similar outcome anyway, without all of the kind of unnecessary stress of have, having to, get something really um, kind of compli unnecessarily complicated mm -hmm. out. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess for this piece, just with the it, the performers, I'm, I'm not sure if the, the score is being shown, but performers, they make, they just illustrate a piece of paper, whatever, whatever mediums they'd like, or even like a piece of cloth. I think that's a footnote there, yeah. anything that can be folded up. Um, it, it, it could be any level of kind of intensity when it comes to like that part of the process, however people want to go about it. Um, and then I include a little diagram of how to fold a single sheet into a little book. And I guess at a certain point, people might get a sense of what ends up where when it comes to the pages. But I, I thought it was interesting to incorporate a level of chance in it to kind of, even though you're working on a piece of paper or like or whatever it is for so long and getting certain ideas about like, oh, if this is going to be a score, what's, what, how am I going to interpret this? Adding that kind of element of chance and kind of a, putting it into a structure, I thought was kind of interesting. Thing. And I guess, too, with the kind of music I was writing um, more concretely, I was getting to a point where things were just very, very basic forms and very, very minimal. So at its basis, this piece kind of presents in the book format one short phrase, three longer phrases, and then one short phrase at the end, kind of bookended. And that's like the basic structure. And then whatever goes in there. Is, yeah, yeah. I, I would I would also add, like, I, I don't think this score is up yet, but I like just for our viewers, I know you, you wrote it, so you obviously know this, but I really like the fact that um, it, it is for solo or for multiple people. And mm. so the idea is everybody makes um, their own book. And so you would play through your book and that's kind of like movement one. And then you would mm. exchange scores. And so the second movement, you would actually be reading off someone else's score. So not only are you um, instilling kind of like this, or, or you're not, you're, you know, allowing each artist to have this creativity within themselves, but then they are also able to interpret somebody else's score, which I think is really 
interesting. Like, I really like that part about it. And I almost wish, you know, if it wasn't COVID, like, we could have yeah. even, like, you know, two people up here just to perform it that way. Because I think that brings this other element um, to your piece as well, which yeah. I really thought was was um, clever. Yeah, oh, so the image is about to come up on screen. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I actually was... I do like the idea of um, having, I mean, obviously in this situation, it was a bit premeditative. Like I even brought like paper clip or sorry, um, clothespins to hold the book. Um, I think these are things, I don't know if your first um, uh, performance of this, there were any issues with the books, like even mm. closing or things like that. and. For me, I mean, it se seems like such an annoying thing to like yeah. mention because it's like, okay, whatever. But also it is like, we are reading off these scores and, and the pages. And this is why I also tried on a regular right piece on. of paper to, to see. And I think it still um, can be like a bit of trouble. So I, I think on one hand, if you come kind of prepared for the book to like stay open, that's great. But I think part of your piece is to actually have this visual aspect and i think it is interesting to see like i love going to shows where i am watching music and they'll hire like also an artist to be painting oh, on yeah. the side and i love that and i think i i was imagining your piece like even like in a larger scale where everyone was able to have like larger canvases so you know there's like this big canvas and like the audience is watching. I think that's like a really cool visual. And then to see the book being made, which is what you're saying is your, yeah. what you've been getting into. I think that's like a really interesting thing to also see. Um, so I really like that aspect of it um, as well as, um, you know, actually playing the piece. So yeah. <laughs> um, I think that is something like, I don't, I, it sounds like you're kind of like cool with whatever, but maybe you want to think about for like, if you want it to be like a certain thing, like I do want the performance to have this element to yeah. it. Um, Cause I, I think that is in fact, like an important part of this piece. Um, and yeah, so that's like one of the things I was thinking about when I, when I was um, making this and like checking out your piece. Um, what else did I write? Yeah, also like the premeditative premeditative versus meditative. I think um, because your piece right now is um, one page, it's like mm -hmm. the instructions are all there. I did find myself like I was like, okay, I see what's coming here. I did draw a little bit like I'm like, okay, I need like pages here. Like I did kind of have this premeditative thought go into it so I did have you know like I didn't plan it out intentionally I was actually intentionally trying not to make it too much like that right. but I think I think it would be cool like if there were even like like more pages being like step one like draw mm -hmm. this image and then that way you, you know your artist doesn't know what's coming and I, th I think that could be a cool element. I mean, obviously, this is like just ideas at this point because yeah. I think you don't have to, like your piece as is is great. Like, I think it's really cool. I think there's like an aspect of it that could even be more like of a surprise because there mm. is spon spontaneity throughout the piece already. But if you have like, you know, step one, draw this image. Step two, make it into this book. And that way, you know, your artist might be like, oh, I didn't even know, like, I didn't even know this was coming. The audience yeah. doesn't know it's coming. So I don't know. That's, that's like something I thought about when I was, I was making it. Um, so I don't know what you think about that, but. Um, yeah, I think it's, I guess with this piece, it was, it's kind of pushing further than I've gone before when it comes to like connecting different kinds of media. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's almost just like a, a very basic kind of idea that I put out there. And that's why I'm, I, I was so interested to hear another performer's feedback. Because mm -hmm. I guess for me, at least, it's like I feel like there's so many different ways that people would interpret this. Right, yeah. To a certain extent, I was even maybe thinking like, oh, if it, a certain performer might 
decide to do like a transcription onto staff paper of what what their book has spat out at them as right. going to be what the book is, or like all of these different these different kind of scenarios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I like that. I like that it's kind of oh, can you hear me right now? <laughs> I think it's frozen. A really interesting element and how could also how, how did i not think about that but it kind of draws up these oh shoot okay sure sure <laughs> the freezing is like <laughs> I think I'm hearing audio again. Okay. Or, Hello. Okay, I can hear the audio. The, okay, the, perfect. Coming back a little bit, yeah. Do you mind repeating just yeah. about you know the last everything you said? <laughs> everything you said, yeah. basically. <laughs> okay, I, I I guess I broke up too. Then okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. No. No problem. Um. I guess what I was saying. Um. When it was first performed, those performers said to me, "Oh, we've decided to incorporate the book binding process in the beginning. Of, like we're going to even do the illustrations and everything at the very beginning of the performance." just so that people could see that and kind of take it there. And I, I was kind of surprised and I also thinking to myself like, wow, how could I, how didn't I like predict that could have been one of the, the possible ways that people could have taken it. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, it brings up this question to me of like, well, how much do I put explicitly in the score? Like how much, what goes in the score about the range of possibilities or even like, it could be like, narrow down even further and be even more vague like how <laughs> right what, do, what, what goes in and what comes out and what what are the possible outcomes because of that <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean for me because i am an artist who does mostly improvise i do like less instruction personally yeah. um for me i like the fact that i can interpret it the way i'd want to whereas like i think some people do like you know more instruction they're like i don't really know like what I'm, like what do i do like i i'm confused mm -hmm. you know there, there are gonna be there's gonna be that camp and there's gonna be people who are like oh whatever it's like just do what it says you know like and um so you know i think that is still at a certain point up to your discretion and um you know at this point you could even put a note like maybe if you want it to be um, up to their discretion, write a note, like you can put the drawing in, in within the performance or choose not to. Um, mm -hmm. You can, and, and I think maybe that's the instruction that can be clearer is you're free to do whatever. Yeah. Or you're free to interpret this however you want. And maybe that is the one instruction that would help people understand like, okay, like I don't have to draw this on stage or, or paint this on stage. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they, they could be like, oh, I can totally do that and I want to do that. So I think that's like maybe the note, especially I'm getting from you that you, you are, this is kind of experimental for you as well. Yeah. So you're probably happy to see any outcome. From yeah, it. definitely. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's what I would, say about that like include a note if i could add something yeah. um just as this is sophie by the way i'm off camera just as someone who <laughs> sorry i'm just gonna pull down one of my masks as someone who always plays strictly off of written things um yeah definitely as Anne was saying like she's so used to doing pretty much exclusively improv um and i'm not <laughs> but that's kind of the fun of this is it really does push both yourself and the performer out of the box um, one performance element, I don't know if this is what you've already experimented with, but is figuring out a way to project whatever's on the performer's stand mm. onto like a big screen somewhere, um, either like old school projector or, or, you know, like literally a camera that somehow the flute player doesn't get in the way of, mm. um, that could be a really cool sort of addition so that the audience really is on the same ride. Yeah. Um, because the visual part is just like, I was looking at the score before, um, and started playing. I was like, this is so cool right now. And it, yeah. it is really cool to imagine um, the audience being able to experience that, like, oh, this is where the performer is getting their inspiration and that kind of thing. So just like a performance thing, um, mm -hmm. that could be a really nice little touch if you have the technical technological capabilities for it, of yeah. course. Can't assume that every hall has a screen, but I don't know, just yeah. like 
yeah I, what's your mind? I totally like i think that's a really good idea i actually didn't even think of the projection mm -hmm. that's i think that's really cool I, I actually even thought in in my brain my dull brain Descent. didn't think about projection but um but i you know i did think about displaying you know the pieces um Oh, hope you can hear me right now. <laughs> I can hear you, yeah. It's okay, coming in and out a little bit. But okay. Yeah. You know, displaying the pieces at the end of the show. So as people walk out, they mm. have, you know, the visual after they've heard what, you know, because I think it is cool to have the projection while the person is playing. But also there is an element of, um, okay, well, maybe you just want to have an, a, an audio experience mm. and then see the the pieces as you leave and kind of see where it came from and i think both ideas could totally yeah. work mm -hmm. just depending and, and obviously this has been performed before and they have the capability to make the art on stage so i think it just is also dependent on what kind of scenario you're in and it can be almost like a different experience every time and that's what's yeah. so fun about it is yeah it could be a completely different experience based on the venue the people all of that so exactly yeah. I, i'm just yeah. like really enjoying this right now yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's really cool i love i love this um concept that you yeah yeah come thank you so much yeah. yeah it's it's interesting to hear too because i guess it, it goes I, when I hear like, um, I guess this is the second time now from feedback from performers, it's like, wow, this is like taking it in a whole other direction than, because this process for me is so almost like process based for like a, the, the, like the work before a piece. Mm -hmm, so almost mm -hmm. in my mind too, this would be like, oh, well, this could be like something that an activity that gets done. And then maybe like, maybe you notate it afterwards, or like maybe this becomes like someone else's composition or is used as like a, a, a form to extract and then use in another composition. and. Mm -hmm it might have no like identity at all when it comes to the original piece. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I guess like maybe even putting some kind of note about that, like this whole process, the book piece doesn't necessarily have to be involved in the final performance or, or at all. Yeah. Versus exactly. it could be the center of the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And I think, Oh, it's frozen again oh. on my end. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear again. I can hear. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think even going forward with your compositions, like after the book piece, I think that's a really great way of just kind of getting the artist to, you know, ha have have their their kind of interpretation. And I, for me, like I really enjoy it I, because you know I, I love improvisation, and this is totally like for me up my alley. So. Yeah. Um, the more freedom I have, actually, the more I enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I love that. Um, let me see what else I wrote here. Okay, yeah, I did talk. Yeah, so you did write about, like, adhesive on the books. I think that was, like, my main thing. Um, right. In terms of, like, pro running into problems was keeping the books. Oh, did Was that an issue on your... Um, I think they use like really large paper. Large paper. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. I, maybe that is something to take into account as well. Yeah. Um, because as, especially if you're going to draw or paint or, or whatever media you choose yeah. to use, if it's, if it's too small, like it's just, and, and you know, this paper, this um, mixed media paper that I use is, is quite, it's bigger than your standard like letter right, right. size. So, um, yeah, I mean, I know that's just, just such an annoying, like, stupid little thing that it's like... No, it's, it's really good to hear, though. I guess I'm, I'm thinking at this point, like, the score might be the score, but definitely I should think about including a performance note in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which kind of goes through all of these different kind of concerns and outcomes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, even including a list of, um, for example, me, you know, scissors could be something you put in the score, like, make sure you have a pair of scissors to... Like I did kind of was able to rip mine and I also used scissors for the other one, but um, just things like that, um, whether they choose to have them or not, like like I said, like I could rip the paper, but maybe just have uh, in the score, like just some things to keep Right, like mind. materials required. Materials, yeah, exactly. Um, because I did find myself as I was making the score, like being like, oh shoot, I need this. And I would like go get right. something and then, you know. Um, 
yeah so what else did i say oh yeah i love the mixed medium stuff too like i i loved using the paint again like with the book like making sure i mean they're gonna figure it out like it's it's yeah. gonna be fine like once the thing is made it's like i figured it out so um that that is something i, I don't know if you felt like it was disruptive like while i was reading mm. that i was like kind of fussing with the pages I mean, that's something to, that you can take into yeah. account for the future. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's like, really what I, my thoughts on it. Like, it's, I mean, I think, I think it's great. And, and there's just, like, a little, a couple of hiccups here and there. But right. that's really, like, what I noticed as I was going through the experience myself. So cool. yeah, yeah, that's that's really helpful. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you had any other thoughts or questions. Um, um, even that, regarding I'm, yeah. like anything for future or things like that. Um, I guess I guess for me, I was always of the like the the thought that oh, this could be when it comes to like interpreting like a graphic score, it could turn into something very structured, even without like doing a formal notation or anything within like the mind of the performer mm -hmm. going through yeah like almost the extent that like someone could have their little book and like that's their book for this piece and if they do the piece with different people then the book is still their book exactly they use, and there's kind of like a set interpretation yeah and i was a bit curious about like because i guess i i have my my kind of process that i like to do but um like for you when mm -hmm. it comes to do, like interpreting a graphic score especially one that you might be doing multiple times like how that works with like a set interpretation or like improvisatory elements right so for me um and actually i think i will also demonstrate the the florida side for you my my mm. florida painting um and kind of take a different approach to it because i for this side i didn't have to do it like this but i i took a very textural approach mm. like maybe i'll try one where it's like the, on the other side maybe i'll do like more of a melodic thing but i think for me i like the fact that my interpretation is going to be different every single time mm. i think that's part of it and somebody could absolutely come up with something solid that they want to play every time based on what they have created um but i think the beauty of it is that you can just simply read it as you see it at the time how you feel at the time mm -hmm. you know when i was drawing these things like this is just how i felt in the time you know and that's the beauty of it and if i perform this on another day i might not actually be even feeling the things i was feeling on the page when i was creating it but that's then i'm free to interpret it that way yeah so um that and and that's just like me as an individual of course like anyone else can have a different interpretation of how to read graphic scores. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I just like to f play what I feel on the day yeah. according to what I'm seeing. So why don't I try playing for you the other side? And I'll think like less, I mean, it'll still be quite textural probably because there's like lots of textures on here, but um let, well, let's let's see let's see what happens <laughs> awesome I, i'll mute, mute myself again uh, yeah <laughs> okay so oh and just so everyone can see um so this is basically the page here and camille has camille has instructed us to um fold the panels into eight and then cut a slit in the middle here um so that way, when you fold it, these pages come out. Maybe you can see this, right? So you have this, and now that's a book with pages. So that's very cool. I love that. Love it. So cool. <laughs> love it. OK, so I'm going to play this.
Yeah, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I I feel like in, in that in this take I I took a little bit more of like a melodic route where especially with this drawing there are so many like visuals that you see in real life. There's like a sun on here and like an alligator and a boat and waves. Yeah. And the sky like there's a sunset. So I wanted to interpret it in a way where okay, how does this make me feel? Like, I mean, the last one is, for me, was obvious. It's like a sun. So I really wanted to kind of depict, like, this joyful sort of melody. Um, and, you know, there's pages where, of course, you're going to get... Um, you can hear me right now. Yeah? yeah? Okay. So, you know, you're going to get, like, you know, there's a palm tree, but then there's also, like, the rump of an alligator. So, you know, like, um, there's, like, that juxtaposition, and, and you, and for me, I was like, okay, what does, what image does this, like, play in my mind? So I'm going to play, like, melodically towards that, and, and, you know, there's, there's texture on it, so include that. So I, I, I try to kind of play the first, like, you know, the first time around was very textural, and then the second time was maybe more melodic and um and i think yeah like i don't think this is something that you need to it, you know indicate thank you five so you got five minutes it's not something you have to indicate in your score but i think you know if you were to put together a show and you you know the musicians you're asking to take part of it maybe it's something you can consider like oh i know this person likes to play this way and i like mm -hmm. you know this person likes to play this way and and you can almost curate like a certain sort of vibe with who you mm -hmm. get and like what instruments you get and and maybe you don't want that maybe you just want it to be spontaneous but i think you can also as um knowing how interpretive it is you can also kind of curate certain ways of of having this performance be performed because you know who is going to be performing it for example yeah you know, so I think that's also like an, a really interesting thing. I mean, I, so in my community, like I have musicians that I work with often and I know how they play. And so depending on how I feel, like I'm not choosing anyone because I'm like, oh, I need a guitar or I need a violin or I need this. It's more like, okay, wh whose character do I feel like playing with today? Like who do I want to um, kind of, have be my partner or my group of people who um, I, I know I can play off of and and what vibe that's going to create. So I think that's something to also maybe consider or think about um, if you happen to be curating the show or something yeah. like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I think this is a really, really helpful just getting a lot of feedback and a lot, a lot of good ideas about how to move forward with this. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's been, yeah. Yeah, hopefully that's been helpful. I know like it, it is very interpretive, so it's just like obviously ideas that you can take or leave and yeah. And I think you did a great job. I think, I mean, it's really a cool piece and really fun to make the score. Like I really enjoyed doing that. So yeah, so thank you. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. Yeah, thank you. And it's been great participating in this workshop. So I think it's been really, really helpful for me. Uh, awesome. Love it. All cool. right. Well, thank you, Camille. Good job. Yeah, thank you so much. Hello and welcome back. Thank you for joining us today. Um, again, thank you to Sophie for the workshops earlier and we just worked uh, with Camille on a really great graphic score. And now we have Jenny Wang um, and uh, she wrote a really amazing, robust piece called Yang Yu Huan, is that? Yes, okay, Yang Yu cool. Huan. Yeah, yeah, so this was great. I actually received, just so everybody knows, I did receive a score and a really amazing recording of the piece, um, which you must have, um, I don't know when that was recorded, but it was it really, like, I really enjoyed listening to that. It was great. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. 
so yeah I mean uh do you have any I know you had um laid out a few questions for me um Mm -hmm. and we can get straight into that or I can just say like a I mean I can start talking it whichever you prefer Okay, um, so do you prefer me to introduce this piece a little bit or we can just step into the questions and stuff? You know, introducing the piece would be great. Um, okay. Because I do think there is like quite a narrative to the <laughs> piece and I think it would be great for to, for me to hear from you and also for yeah. anyone watching to know as well. Uh-huh. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you so much. Anne. So I want to introduce from two aspects. First of all, I want to introduce the story behind this piece. Uh, it's called Yang Yu Huan. Uh, and secondly, I will introduce why there is a narration part. It's related to like uh, how to write a solo piece. Also one of my questions here. So first of all, Yang Yu Huan is the name of a really famous woman in the Asian China. And her is, she is the wife of the emperor. Uh, which is the king of that um, that destiny. And then uh, her life looks perfect from outside because she seems like she has everything she wants. She's really rich and she's really, really beautiful. She's one of the four most beautiful ladies in the Asian China, like um, common sense. Uh, so, and then, uh, but actually her life is pretty miserable inside because the whole country think her beauty is the curse of this country uh, and also for the emperor. So actually she was killed by her own husband which is the emperor um uh, around like several thousand years ago when she was still really young so uh i want to dedicate this piece for her because she dedicated all her life to the country but actually she lives a miserable life and killed by her own husband and there is a narrative part where the flute is not only played the flute but also will have to uh, narrate this poem and this poem is by a poet that lives in the same time as Yang Yuhuan lives uh, it's like 5,000 years ago and this poet is talking about how beautiful she is and um, how her life looks like perfect from outside And I talk to different performers and composers of some of my friends and some of them think, you know, writing an orchestra piece is even easier than writing a solo piece because it's harder to make a solo piece interesting. You just have one choice. So in this piece, I, I try to use different methods to make different solo piece, uh, interesting piece. Like for one of my saxophone solo, um, I dig into 15 different extended techniques in 15 different length of movements. So in this piece, I am trying to tell the story and try to use the narrative part to make it a pretty unique solo piece, unless like just simply use the uh, use the food. And also uh, obviously so, some extended techniques also show in this piece. Um, I think that's pretty much what I want to talk about about this piece. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. So we did actually have a little chunk of the, like just the ending of the story cut out. You actually did cut out, but I think uh, we, I mean, I I understood kind of what, I think what happened, you know, she she did have her life end and then you kind of were talking about how you translated that into a solo piece. Um, Yeah, and one of your questions had been, you know, how to make, you know, writing for solo instrument versus you know, writing for orchestra. Um, And I did have a few thoughts, maybe more like of a mindset um, sort of um, thought about this, because when you are writing for orchestra or you're writing for a chamber group or, you know, a group of people, you are kind of thinking about um, how everybody plays a role within this piece. So you, yes. you know, and I think when you're writing for a solo uh, instrument, um, for me, you know, I I really per- love playing solo and I love playing with people. I think 
my favorite is almost playing duo because you do get this interaction with somebody Mm -hmm. and I think you as a composer can almost even think of yourself as the second or maybe actually you're the you're the first person because you are the one creating the piece so it's almost like a a duet between you and me Mm -hmm. and I think that's a way you can think about it instead of thinking oh how can I make this interesting um, maybe think of it as more of a conversation you're having with me uh-huh. and and I think in this case I think you wrote a really beautiful piece I would honestly I, I have some thoughts and ideas about it but I wouldn't really actually change anything because I can see you have this story and you've you have this poem and the narrative part and and the piece is quite narrative um, not only with the narration but in the way you've written it I, there's I can hear like these arcs and valleys and you know I I totally get the picture so I think Aww. you did a really great job in That's writing great. this piece Thank you so much yeah. I'm so glad you understand the narration yes I truly trying to use the music to tell the story yeah. uh yeah um like there's a really fast passage a really complicated texture that means the war the war because she actually died in the war and the yeah the ending, the uh, the tongue ram means like she died. So it's like, right, kind of, right. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm so glad you, you understand them all. I really, I really love that. I, I think you could almost include these. So what details you're telling me, when I was playing it, I did like interpreting what I was playing, but you could also, as an alternative, write in the score or on a separate piece of paper, um, the story or like what is happening in this point. So the tongue rams, I didn't actually know, actually reading the poem, I didn't actually know she died. I could understand that it was a very like sad and I I could understand it from the piece as well, Uh just with the piece and the poem. I actually Uh didn't know that she died. So you can add those things because I think for me, that sparks an image for me. And so when I'm playing it, I do, I probably will play it a little bit differently mm-hmm. knowing, okay, this is representing death. Okay. This is representing yeah. life, you know? So you can feel free. And again, this is just an idea. Like I think as is, I love the fact that you can just interpret it the way mm-hmm. you want. But I think um, writing also these little details could alter or change the way a performer thinks about this piece. Um, And I think the story you told at the beginning when you were introducing the piece, I think that could also be part of um, the score um, as as a story separate, just for uh, either the audience can hear it or if, if not the audience, at least the performer, because it does induce a lot of emotions and feelings, mm-hmm. and I think that can help with the interpretation of the piece. Um, but I think, um, in terms of that, I think you did a really great job here. And um, it, when you're writing, so in, this is an example of like sort of a narrative piece. So mm-hmm. you're writing for a solo flute, and I can hear the narrative. The thing is, it doesn't always have to be that way going forward when you're writing solo pieces like what i was saying before um you are kind of like the we're like duo partners and you Mm want to think about things like you know who am i writing for so in this case you're writing for flute how like in quotes flutey do you want to make it Mm -hmm. or how like challenging almost because if you write something that's very challenging for us Mm -hmm. it might be hard but we're going to interpret it a certain way it's going to come out sounding a certain way you know so do you want it to be narrative do you want it to be textural do you want it to be melodic do you want it you know there's all these things you can kind of um, make for us to interpret and i think you know writing and playing is a a form of self-expression so here you have this story and narrative that you're trying to express the story through which i think you did an amazing job of doing that Mm -hmm. and um 
yeah, in the future, like, I think just thinking kind of what you want to hear or what you want to pull out of a player could be great. And also, I think what you had that was really great in this piece was also kind of ideas that came back. Like, you can hear melodies that come back. I th of course, a piece doesn't have to have that, but I think that is a nice thing for people to grab mm -hmm. on to, um, depending on what kind of piece you want to write. Like, if you want to write this melodic thing with story um, weaved into it, you can see the character coming back. So I think you did do a great job of that and just, yeah. I, I mean, I'm really a big believer of like, you can essentially do whatever you want and depending on how somebody interprets it, it can just come out great. Um, and I also like would encourage, you know, if you're writing for a flute player and it seems like maybe you did this since you have a performance of it, kind of working with somebody um, in when you're writing it. And even if you don't have somebody to work with it, maybe think of somebody who you love. For example, if you want to write a piece for bassoon, okay, why do you want to write for bassoon? Um, oh, I like this sound that a bassoon makes. Okay, mm -hmm. so like maybe this is what you want to center your piece around um, is mm -hmm. the sound or like, this weird thing that it does like you know you can think about like why you're writing a piece and and clearly like I, I don't really have to tell you that because you you wrote this narrative which is really beautiful but yeah I, I do understand like the challenges of writing for a solo instrument and maybe you want to just gather your thoughts on why you want to write a, a solo piece for this instrument and uh, actually you two might have oh sorry she's speaking or frozen oh uh, sorry, the audio's not coming through. Oh, yeah, I can hear you oh, right here, now. No. Okay, great. Um, do, do you mind if I just add something? Um, yeah. One thing that's really awesome about composing for a solo instrument is that you can make use of the silence so much more. Like, there's yeah. this intimate, almost like a monologue quality to solo instrument writing. So if you kind of look at it as completely different than orchestral music, but take advantage of the fact that there is more space for silence mm -hmm. and that is your second instrument you know and like that's where you can so get so much contrast and it's so mm -hmm. hard to achieve that in orchestral music um not impossible obviously but i think that's something that i always think about with solo music is like i can take my time when i'm playing this or i can use the space of sound and silence as mm -hmm. i want to use it um, or as the composer writes in so that's something that i mean i don't know this piece so i'm speaking based on just the idea of solo versus orchestral mm -hmm. um but something really special about solo music is having people lean in and be like oh you know making use of this dead silence that's so hard to achieve when you have a 70 piece orchestra versus yeah. one person um so there's like that intimacy and that vulnerability of solo music um is something that it could be a really fun thing to tap into. I mean, obviously you, you've already written solo flute music and I, I don't know your piece yet, but um, I think that's that's always my thought about solo versus orchestral is there, you approach them in such different ways, um, but they both have such different ways to portray something. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, instead of thinking of it as a challenge, it's more of just like a the beauty of solo music is like you can embrace these things that are so difficult to embrace in different contexts. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, and they're powerful. So that's a really great, great point, Sophie. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, do you have any thoughts about just um, solo uh, solo writing in general, or do you feel like? Um, yeah, but I think I really agree with what well, you said. Communication between me and the performer. But would you please um, space specify it a little bit because. Um, I know like I'm a composer and I'm writing piece. You consider that as a communication. Does it mean like, um, uh, like I, I write everything on the score to tell the performers what to do or like is the communication between me and a specific performer and working like, um, like what, what fits her the most or should I write the solo like for, 
Uh, yeah, I'm just a little bit confusing about this communication part. Like, what uh, would you think is the best way to communicate I via see. the score, the score and stuff? I totally understand because uh -huh. you know, with a score that can be you know interpreted different ways, you're not always going to be there. And I think there is um, a beauty with not including everything. Um, mm -hmm. Although if you want something, I would say if you want something very specific, I would say write that in. Um, mm -hmm. If you're okay with the piece kind of taking its own life, um, mm -hmm. because you are the composer, so you probably have an, an idea of what you, you want. But mm -hmm. if your idea is to be like, you know what, this part is free. I, you know, for example, in this, say there is a part that the, the spring wind sweeps do, like that's one mm -hmm. of the translations. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want that section to be a little freer, like in your mind, like wherever that is in the piece. Maybe you're mm -hmm. like, I don't, you know, I'm not concerned about the notes maybe. I'm maybe just more concerned about having this sound. So, mm -hmm. um, in that case, maybe you don't have to even write specific notes. You can just say wind sound or mm -hmm. something like that. As long as you feel like you are able to communicate um, what you have in, in your mind to the performer. And if you are, say, writing for somebody, of course you can work with them and they can give you feedback. But if you're writing for just general, like, I'm writing this for any flute player, just write in the things that you think are important that you definitely want to happen. Um, mm. And I think the rest can be interpretive. And I think that's a great thing about, especially like, you know, modern pieces is that there is a lot to kind of be interpreted. And um, I, for me, I think that's the best part because when I go see a performance, I don't, want to see what I heard on the recording. I mean, obviously uh -huh. I do uh -huh. at, to some degree because I liked what I heard, but I also want to see like, how is this person going to interpret this? And how is, how is it going to come out today? And as the performer as well, I want to be like, okay, how is this going to come out today? You know, like it could be different than yesterday. So, um, I, yeah. So that's what I would say to that is like anything that you want very specific, write it down anything and, and I would say like even in your score like you did write like I, I think it's quite clear mm -hmm. um I could e I could even use more like fra phrases sometimes like like you know if like going back to her death like I would even write on top she dies Died. <laughs> yeah yeah you know um if that's how you felt like if that was important to you for mm -hmm. the the artist to know um, because that is your communication to me mm -hmm. in that point so um does that answer your qu question does that clarify a bit more yeah yeah that's pretty clear but that brings another question because you said sometimes if i want to spe specify something i write it on the score but in terms of solo piece because it's definitely different to chamber music and orchestra but how uh, what level of freedom do you think is the best that i can give the performer um because sometimes you know i write too many like improvisation and stuff when sometimes you know my my professor said you know you have to write it out otherwise like they don't know what, what to play but i think it's gonna be different answers for the solo piece so how, how do you think about this part like the level of freedom right well talking to me specifically i am an improviser so i oh, wow. i am quite comfortable um you know and maybe sophie can pitch in um, her opinion as well but for me i do like a lot of freedom uh, mm -hmm. so when i see a score where it's kind of like okay in this section you can do what, whatever i think that's really like great because that gives the performer an opportunity to kind of interpret what whatever you've written on the score because of course you know you've written something it, it's not just like a blank ca canvas and it's like okay interpret this unless it's actual nothing um you know I, and i i personally like that um i i do understand like sometimes people are like okay i need a little more to work with um but personally i don't and i know it sounds like you have 
um, professors you said you were working with who might, or yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like people might have opinions on that yeah. and I, I'm not to like, totally, if you're in a class and somebody is telling you to do something a certain way for an assignment, definitely do that to mm -hmm. practice it. But I think when you're just out in the real world, like you, there's no rules. Like you can just do what you want. Uh -huh. and that's that's what I think, but um, <laughs> love this idea. Yeah, I mean, Sophie, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, about I mean, it obviously also depends on the the background of the flute players you're planning on working with. Um, I'm assuming you're probably in a predominantly classical realm, um, and that's my realm for sure. Uh, that being said, I think um, performers who have enough confidence in themselves, like if, if if I were to play something and there was some sort of improvisation section um as long as there's a general guideline of like what am i trying to depict during this section or um even like a graphic line up and down of i want this shape to the sound or you know that kind of thing um that sort of still allows me the freedom but it gives me an idea of you know it, it gives me some training wheels so to speak yeah. so um if you want something like very pointillistic and articulate or if you want something that's very sweeping and virtuosic or you know um absolutely berserk and random notes and all that kind of stuff like uh some sort of guidance um and it could be a visual graphic part of the score or it could be you know a scene and you're trusting the performer to interpret it as they wish um, mm -hmm. So it also depends on how much control you would like over how it should sound. And there's no right or wrong mm -hmm. answer because at the end of the day, you're the composer. If you say free, you know, it's, it's free for whatever you want there, then just put the idea, the, the scenery. Um, if you have a specific sound in mind, but you don't care too much about the notes, then I'd say maybe something graphic. Um, and I would feel comfortable enough with that famous yeah. last words but I, I actually i do think i would be comfortable enough um with a score as long as the composer gave me some sort of idea so i don't go totally in the opposite direction but uh yeah i mean it also depends you know on who you're working with but i think you know with contemporary music like this you're probably going to be working with someone who has some faith in themselves so uh you know a little bit of freedom for improvisation i think is um totally fair and for a classical person you know just give them a, a little bit of guidance but uh you can trust them i think yeah i i can thank you for that by the way um it's nice to have two perspectives here yeah. i think um um i can even give you Same. like a little bit of a a solid um example so you just kind of have an idea of what um you know because i actually found your score quite um true to what was going to happen like mm -hmm. I, I actually didn't find um there was you know like there is a lot of room for interpretation but you know e everything is there um but say um for example uh the on the fifth page kind of you know all, all the bars there so 53 to 62 you mm -hmm. have that it's this is the war section right Mm -hmm. it, yes, actually, it exactly. actually goes earlier it goes from like you know around like 48 uh -huh. to yeah yeah whatever um so you have these um textures almost that it's coming in and out of like this wispy key clicks into full sound and mm -hmm. obviously you're trying to paint a picture here i think and it, and it was very clear to me that that's what you're doing um i think in this sort of situation I, and and I, I have to say, I like your no note choices. I, I really like um, this, some of the scales that are coming out. You could almost be a little even less specific. For, for example, okay. let's just for example say bar 55, okay? Mm -hmm. You have this, these upward scales. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically like, I mean, it starts on an E-flat, ends on an F, but it's D-flat major, okay? Um, you could even go, here's your starting note, here's your top note, D-flat major, anything. And okay. have have it be, I, would you feel comfortable with that, Sophie? Yeah, as you long know, as there's like some sort of structure to it. It doesn't have to be specific, though. Yeah, Yeah, and, and, and kind of like draw out the contour of it mm -hmm. and kind of have 
like if you want a specific skill like write a specific skill but it doesn't have to necessarily be all written out as an example like i wouldn't necessarily change this i think this is great what you have here but just as an example of like what you could potentially do um as an option um yeah yeah does that kind of make sense oh i think it cut out a little bit sorry the audio is cutting out a bit sorry <laughs> it'll be back don't worry <laughs> it just might take a minute Oh, he's back. Okay, okay yeah, great. great. Sorry, could you say that again? Sorry. No, I, w I, I said I lost you from time to time. Oh, okay. Oh, but, during yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want me to repeat it? I can... Uh, oh. I, I think I got the part of you say I can just give a contour and then like the performers choose what notes to play. Yeah, yeah. And mm. yeah, and you could be as specific as you want. Like you, you know, uh -huh. you want it to be this scale or this these notes. You can even write out the notes and just say you any of these notes, but you don't have to play okay. all of them. You know, mm -hmm. and I see that I've seen all that a lot in um, some modern scores. Uh -huh. I mean, I I come from I mean I come from a classical background, but also jazz, and okay. I've worked with like a lot of like free artists and composers and I've seen mm. where they have or even in jazz you know it's like they're writing out the notes it's like here's oh. all the notes you can use you don't have to use all of them just mm -hmm. you know you stay within this realm but mm -hmm. you can choose which notes you want to use so okay. you can also do that okay um yeah so do you have any other thoughts about solo pieces or we can go into talking about this piece in specific or um some other ideas i want to hear is because you know solo piece is more flexible so that's why yeah i love to write for a solo piece uh it's more easier to arrange for any events and occasions so do you have any good idea like combine solo piece with other types of arts that would be uh, you would be interested in maybe in the future and stuff. Mm, okay, like other media. Yes, for example, this one is uh, it's not really a good example because I only combine the solo piece with narration. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking maybe other type of um, arts like uh, like screening or like dancing or like um, um, yeah, other types of theater work and stuff. Yeah, so I do I do think it is interesting when we use the word solo because it does almost feel like there is some sort of um you know, communication with other people yeah, even yeah, even exactly. with you, you know. So um if you were to have this other media and depending on how improvisational you want it to be. Um mm -hmm. so like for example, let's just take this piece as an example. Um maybe you have the story um so like, i mean you there is a story here so like there is this visual that i can imagine in my head when you tell the story maybe you want somebody illustrating that as you know the piece is happening and have them react to um different sections of the piece or you could have you know a dancer kind of you know Da dance their way through this narrative or an actor or um what you know a video you can you can create like images or if you even wanted to take images from um like i, I this the story sounds like it's like an ancient like it's like a like it's not like a modern story right <laughs> so yeah. so you know like maybe if it's a popular story, maybe find images of that or find mm -hmm. visuals and you can project those things. And I think uh -huh. that is quite interesting as well. And I think that would be a, a great way yeah. to also, mm -hmm. you know, like if you didn't want to tell the story, um, that is another way to for somebody to kind of understand like what's happening in the piece mm -hmm. um, if you want if you wanted that. So I think that is like a, a great thing to consider 
especially yeah. this because it, it's it's so um there's so many places that it goes and it's very interesting mm -hmm. and i think another artist could have a lot of fun like interpreting it either on the spot or beforehand um you know th there's i think there's like a lot you could really potentially do with it and actually the, the composer that was before you um they were like the the prompt was basically for the um performer to create you know paintings or drawings or images of some sort and then fold it into a booklet and improvise based on what they see and we oh, also had the discussion wow. about um you know uh, performers and then having painters live painting in front of the audience as they hear the music what inspires their painting and so it's really cool especially about solo music is that mm -hmm. there is so much spontaneity in it and this can inspire other mediums like dance and you know miming anything mm -hmm. to also have that same improvisation and spontaneity and sort of reaction to the music itself. So, you know, if you have friends who are dancers or visual artists and are comfortable with, you know, improvising on the spot in a concert, it'd be cool to have one of your pieces performed. And mm -hmm. obviously it's nice if, if the person has an idea of what the piece is, but the spontaneity of a solo performer and what they could do with the piece and the freedom they have with the piece, plus another performer or artistic medium um, combining is actually a, a really cool sort of reaction and uh adds that extra dimension so mm -hmm. something you know see it sounds like you're interested in that kind of thing so could be fun yeah it sounds pretty it. interesting especially you mentioned something like the pen uh, the painter like uh painting things given uh what they say it's like action painting uh, yeah i was definitely thinking about something like action solo or mm -hmm. similar to the action painting and stuff it's gonna be really interesting with solo because you have more much more flexibility with the solo career yeah and i i, I actually have seen like several shows where they are live painting to oh, music wow. and i think it really adds this really interesting dimension and and depending on what sort of artist you you have it can be because i think a lot of the shows i have been to they, there's a lot of like graffiti artists which is I don't know. It's like a really totally different um, sort of style. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for, you know, even for this, if you had, um, you know, where, where, where the story is come, comes from, it, it's, is it, it's Chinese, right? Yes. So like if you had like a Chinese painter who, who could paint in this yeah. traditional style, like that could be really cool and like, have awesome. it, yeah, you know, and I think you can even think about things like that and, and to kind of, put you in that place as well mm -hmm. you know um so maybe that's something to think about um i i did actually have one thing to say about the piece uh -huh, um sure. because i do find it like honestly it it is i think it's such a beautiful beautifully written piece and it really has a clear narrative like i wouldn't change it um the one thing that i did notice um, uh -huh. in the recording of the performance and and like you could interpret it depending on like how you interpret how you've written it but I noticed that the narration for me because you have all these wonderful textures going on in the flute mm -hmm. and the narration you have dynamic markings but I think it could be almost incorporated into the flute like you know um, because it almost feels like flute narration, flute narration, and the narration, it is beautiful the way it is. And I think the fact that you have the narration off the top, the whole poem, I think that's great. And that should be the way it's um, written here is great. Mm -hmm. But as you get into the piece, because you've, uh -huh. you've said the whole poem now, yeah. right? And I think whatever comes after is almost like part of the piece texturally exactly so even for example like these triple p's i see mm -hmm. like say bar 72 mm -hmm. you've come out of this crying section right <laughs> yeah. and i think you can even have the flute part of the narration so I, I can give you an example 
Yeah, and sure. I think, um, yeah, excuse my um, pronunciation, because <laughs> that, that's, um, that's... so you have just come, so I started bar 68. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So oh, you know, wow. keep the That's flute so beautiful. Yeah. And have it almost be a whisper, and you can uh -huh. whisper into the flute. Uh -huh. Because these words have been said earlier in the yeah, piece. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And so uh -huh. I think once it's within the piece, I think it could be within the textures of what's happening. So I think you can maybe think about playing with the narration actually a bit more. Uh -huh. um, because the flute you like nailed it girl like that's like <laughs> i think you got it i think in the narration be probably because you're not you're like okay you know mm -hmm. i want you to read this part now mm -hmm. um i think you could think of it almost like as an instrument as well actually okay. that yeah me. that's really interesting so that it's not really separated food and narration part exactly it's going to be yeah. more like a whole piece so that makes much more sense yeah actually yeah. it's very yeah i like this me, idea yeah it reminds me of toru takamitsu's voice for solo flute um so i would definitely write that down and look it up afterwards because some of the narration is spoken into the flute and that's what's mm. so cool about the flute is that it has this like open hole you don't have to put it in your mouth or anything so you can actually speak into the instrument and use the instrument as an acoustic um, mm -hmm. vessel for speech, just like what Anne demonstrated. So yeah. if you look up Takamitsu voice for solo flute, you'll see some really uh -huh. cool demonstrations of it. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously Anne just gave you a really cool demonstration tool too. Yeah. So it's less about the clarity of text at that point, because everyone knows what is yeah, being said. Exactly. It's more about the effect of putting it. And again, the flute is like the perfect medium for that. So that was really cool. Thanks, Anne. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and, and thank you. That's a that's a really good recommendation to check out as well. So great, great. Yeah, I will yeah. do. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, did you have any other? I mean, I did write some notes here. I wonder. Well, that's, that's yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Would you be interested in? Sure. Uh, sure. Okay, definitely. Sure. So that was kind of like really the main thing I had to say. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. Like not as criticism of the piece, but more like maybe you want to like experiment with it a little sure. more. Sure, yes, yes, that'd um, be helpful. The other thing I thought is during this like war section, uh -huh. um, there is a lot of, okay, so you have, you're going from this t -t 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 sound mm -hmm. into key mm -hmm. clicks into actual flute sound. Uh -huh. And I think I love I love this section. I think mm -hmm. you could even experiment more with like, because every time you have the tukas come in, it's a open. Like it's um, you know how you have the close like, the close clo yeah exactly, and then you have the open. Yeah. So I think you can experiment even with having, like the half tukka, like because uh -huh. um, right now it's. it's a little bit quiet oh yeah, yeah but maybe yeah, yeah. if it was um even um at bar 53 uh -huh, so uh -huh. you have this ordinary flute so it's like half whole instead oh, of oh wow i like this sound yeah so then you could have more of a bridge from the flute sound to mm -hmm. um the air sound because okay. right now it's very airy and then you get like <laughs> the flute which is great i also like that but maybe you want to think about having transitioning it come in and out yeah transition yes. like okay that. okay gotcha so that was just an idea that i mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. um let's see what else did i write here Um, oh, yeah, my question I was... I think it's frozen oh. again. I... 
Hello. Okay, you're back. Um, okay, perfect. So, also, I did have a question for you because when I uh -huh. listened to the recording and I was looking at the score, it wasn't always matching up, and I was wondering if there's different editions of the score. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. There's just one version. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like the performer, like, you know, second composed that a little bit. Okay, yeah, and I think that was great because you remember how we were talking about how like people might interpret things differently. I know, yeah, this piece is actually one of my piece that has been performed many times. So I I have different performers like performing completely different. And that that is also something that I really like. Yeah. Because yeah, everyone has their own different things to Okay, interpret. perfect. Yeah, yeah. I was just I was just curious about that. Um, uh -huh. like for example, in the recording, the last note she it's like she just blows air. Oh, uh, uh -huh. I'm, I'm saying she. I don't know who it is. They they are blowing air. Uh -huh. But um, but I think it's like a tongue round, right? What you wrote. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yes. I think. Yeah, I think, right. Yeah. You know, maybe you can take a listen to the recording even and see um, what you like out of that and and write it into the score because, um, for example. And actually, there are things that I found were in the score that didn't necessarily happen in the recording that I actually liked what I think your idea was that, that it didn't get performed. And, and not, of course, nothing against the... I think the recording is so wonderful. It's way better than I could play it at this point. Aww. And um, But there's some textures that I felt were missing. So, for example, uh -huh. bar 39... 39... Um, I think what you wrote here was really interesting and I'm and I understand kind of why it didn't come out that way cuz um it's a little bit hard to make this C sound um so I I think you meant this, right? Yes, you're back. Yeah, so I think in this section, yes, that's right. That's okay. correct. Okay, so it's something like that. Um, I actually like it. It is a little bit diff <coughs> difficult. <coughs> Oops, to hear. I'm sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. Um, like this ha. Oh, it's sorry. It's a ha inhale. So. Like, it's hard to hear. Like, for example, in that section, maybe you want it to be heard a bit better, so maybe a different vowel, like... Instead of... Because you can't hear the note. Yeah. So I think I'm... in that case, the performer probably took some liberty to have uh -huh. that note being heard. So... Yeah. You know, that's one thing you could go back and listen to the recording and see, okay, they didn't really do this. Why is that? Is it just a personal oh, interpretation okay. or is it because yeah. they couldn't do it, for example? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like one spot that I found. I like the idea, but, mm -hmm. you know, inhaling a ha sound and move and changing notes because the it's such a wide vowel, you're not getting the air to actually hear. You almost have yeah, to like cover exactly. the aperture hole a little bit, like or like a. That's hoo, true. A yeah, like a. Yeah, even that would work. Yeah. But it is, yeah. ha is pretty big. When I see ha, it's pretty big sound. Exhaling, I think it's okay, but yeah. inhaling, I think. It's like if you t pretend you're taking a sip of a really hot drink, like. <laughs> Like, like yeah. that, maybe, but yeah. it's, yeah, it's hard to notate that for sure. <laughs> exactly, yeah. But that, that's like an example of something that maybe you want to think about and going back to like the communication with your, oh, 
lost connection again. Can you hear me oh, right I now? Can hear you. Oh, yeah, I can hear you right now. It's it's really weird. I can see the image, but I couldn't hear the voice. Oh, okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's just, you know, something to keep in mind. You know, why are they not playing this? Maybe it's not possible. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also okay. Like, you know, if I was performing it and I didn't have access to you, I would just <laughs> play, I would just make make my own interpretation of it. Um, but... Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I only play piano sometimes writing other pieces. Like, uh, I, I don't really have an idea of what is doable, although I do research, but, you know, sometimes I still write, like, not doable things. So Yeah, <laughs> and I think that's totally fine because that's part of, like, the experimentation process yeah. and you're not always going to have somebody there and in fact i think when you do write things that maybe seem impossible it could result in a performer playing it a certain way and maybe that's like not how you wrote it and then you can take how they play it and then transcribe that and then now you have this new thing so uh -huh. i wouldn't even shy away from things that are of course, like things like range. Okay, I can't play lower than a low B. That's different. Mm -hmm. But if you're writing experimental things and you're like, I don't really know if this is going to work. I don't know if this is possible. I think you can still try writing it. Bring it to a flute player or whoever you're writing for. And mm -hmm. they can in, they're, they're, they could be like, okay, this is how I think this would be performed. But okay, maybe I wouldn't write it like this. I would write it like this. And then now you have this new concept that you can use. And it's kind of like your concept in a way so mm -hmm. i think don't think boundaries just think okay i want to try this i want to try this and whatever it's it's this interaction again with you and the performer and i think you can take what these people have you know feedback for you and and take that and and maybe write it a different way next time but you have this new idea so all right and we got five minutes on the clock here yeah, so any more thoughts? Uh, I think I got all my questions answered and those are really helpful, especially the, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of things today, I have to like unpack them slowly yeah. so that I get more idea about like, yeah, we talk about the freedom, we talk about uh, how, how to write things for an instrument you are not familiar with. We talk about the narration part. We talk about, yeah, like everything I need to. Yeah, I'm actually writing another solo piece right now, which is for a double bass. So it's going to be very helpful mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, thank That's you so gonna much. That's going to be cool. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Jenny, And thank you for your beautiful piece. I hope I'm going to send it to um, Sophie probably. So. Oh, yeah, I'm really curious. <laughs> yeah, I want to play it's it. Really That's beautiful okay. Piece. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, Sophie. All right. Thanks, Jenny. All right. Thank you. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. And Bye. I don't know if there's going to be an yeah. outro. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, I'm just sneaking in. Um, so yeah, that's it for today's workshop. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, um, all the composers. And of course, Sophie and Anne for participating and facilitating and sharing your music. Um, so yeah, thanks to everybody, and there's more flute music online at the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra's website all month, so feel free to check it out, and we'll be in touch. Thanks!